Please be seated. Government bills and orders for second reading Bill 1, Alberta Sovereignty within a United Canada Act. Debate adjourned on amendment. Mr. Stephan speaking. The Honourable Member for Red Deer South has four minutes remaining should he choose to use it. Honourable Members, amendment RA1. Are there others? The Leader of the Opposition has risen. <clears throat> Uh, thank you uh, very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. I uh, uh, rise to speak, I believe, in favour of the motion um, as part of our overall uh, position uh, that we are very much opposed to Bill 1, as I believe members of the opposition or members of the government have uh, since become aware of. So I think I have a fair amount of time to talk about this tonight. We'll see how, how long it takes. Um, let's start with what it was, uh, Mr. Speaker, that um, the Premier claimed was driving the introduction of this bill. Because I think that if you go far enough back, Mr. Speaker, it's probably the case that you can actually find some areas of common interest between uh, the government and uh, the official opposition. In particular, the Premier identified the fact that there are occasions where the federal government uh, uh, oversteps its jurisdiction or, in other cases, even acting within its jurisdiction, does things that uh, many people in the province of Alberta um, disagree with. And I think that we can all agree that that does sometimes happen. Now, I'm not going to go through a long um, uh, analysis or critique of uh, the so-called history that uh, the Premier reviewed when she first spoke to Bill 1 mostly because it was a particularly revisionist version of history and uh, one that I know she has sort of uh, unwound on her talk show over many years, but not one I think that is particularly uh, connected uh, to what actually happened, at least not in most cases. However, in some cases there is a definitely commonality. And the Premier often talks uh, right now about two issues which I think do definitely stand to uh, 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 serve to be a source of friction uh, in some cases between uh, some Albertans and, and or the provincial government and the federal government. And one relates to the conversation that is going on right now about the proposed emissions cap in the oil and gas sector. And the other relates to, uh, I think, some long-standing concerns that both um, the current government and the previous government, that being the one that I led, uh, the concerns that we had with what at the time was called uh, Bill C-69, uh, which is the, uh, the, government's, the federal government's um, uh, Environment Protection Act. And so I think it is fair to say that there uh, is some common concern shared there. I would, however, also argue that um, the behavior of this UCP government since they've been elected doesn't actually align with the behavior you would expect to see from a government that was truly pursuing solutions. Rather, it is behavior that you expect to see from a government that is using an external source of anger, uh, or uh, sorry, an, an external target of anger um, as a means of distracting from the many, many, many things that they are failing to get right and to fix and to work on in their own backyard. And um, so that is the pattern that we have seen. And so an example for that, actually, I would argue, could be applied to the conversation that we are currently having about uh, the proposed or the draft emissions cap. Now, there was uh, an emissions cap that uh, our government had proposed uh, with the Climate Leadership Plan, which was considerably higher than the one that is currently being put forward by the federal government. Now, it is actually true that if 
the provincial government had maintained provincial jurisdiction in the matter that is a shared jurisdiction around environmental protection uh, and the way in which efforts to reduce emissions impacted the oil and gas sector. If they had maintained a sense of ownership and responsibility with respect to those issues, the odds are very good that the conversations and the collaboration uh, between the government and industry and ultimately through that in relation to the federal government would have resulted in a resolution that uh, met uh, common objectives on both sides of the argument, both ensuring that the, the, uh, the outcomes were reasonable for the oil and gas industry and were actually achievable in a way that did not negate production and didn't negate the jobs of hard-working Albertans, and at the same time uh, pushed the oil and gas sector to truly invest aggressively in those kinds of innovations that would uh, bring about the kind of uh, important emissions reductions that all of us in Alberta as well as across Canada and across the world need to see. And we could have gotten there and through that we would also have uh, um, eliminated the uncertainty that currently exists and is percolating around right now um, on this topic. But you see we're not at that point Mr. Speaker, and we're not at that speaker at that point because this government decided instead to engage in a whole series of statutory and, and regulatory and communications-based temper tantrums, not to achieve an outcome, but rather to speak to and maintain support amongst a certain base within Alberta. Their audience was always Alberta voters. It was never the people who we should have been working with in order to achieve an outcome that would give greater certainty and better outcomes for industry as well as our environment. And so they didn't do the job and they abandoned the space. So I agree that we are now in a position where we have a federal government offering up a, uh, a draft emissions cap which is problematic for the industry and problematic for Albertans. But what I will, and I will speak more about how this act does absolutely nothing to address that issue but uh, at the same time I will also say that there were better um, tools at the disposal of this UCP government to address this problem and they did not do it and as a result we are instead working with a bill that is purported to achieve one objective but in fact is exceptionally distant from that objective instead. Now the other one that uh, the uh, members talk about, of course, is you know responding to uh, the elements of uh, the uh, environmental legislation that was amended as a result of Bill C-69. And on that, there were common positions, again, between the UCP government and our government. Indeed, we did detailed submissions to the federal government and to the Senate about why that bill should not go ahead. And ultimately, I believe this UCP government adopted our submissions uh, once they were um, elected. Now, obviously, that was not successful and the matter has gone to court and we will see where that ultimately is where it lands uh, once the Supreme Court of Canada uh, has a chance to adjudicate on that matter and likely will get some version of an answer next fall. But this act does not in any way, shape or form appear to provide any tools uh, to Albertans or those people impacted by that uh, piece of federal um, legislation. Um, and, and so once again, it is completely disconnected from the purported objective. And I, once again, I would argue that the purported objective is almost entirely political and it is really designed to stoke anger and then therefore sort of a backhanded kind of support for a, a flailing uh, UCP government um, and, and that's entirely what it's for and nothing more. So that being sort of the, the setting for why or how we got to it and why people bothered to bring this act in, you know, what do people think about it at its sort of outset, almost even before it was, what, what about the principle of this act? What, what do most people think about it? Well, we just got a poll 
a few days ago that suggests that 53% uh, of Albertans uh, do uh, ob object to the statement that this act is an important tool for standing up for Albertans' interests. And only 32% of Albertans agree with the statement that this act is an important tool for supporting Albertans' interests. So clearly, this government is not actually focused on representing the desires or the wants of Albertans. So that's not what's going on here. Um, we also, of course, heard a lot about this act from members of uh, the government caucus um, in the course of their leadership contest. And at that time, you know, uh, I guess leadership contests uh, invite people to use their inside voice and or their slightly more accountable and transparent voice. And so let's, you know, just do a little walk down memory lane in terms of what members of the UCP now cabinet or in some cases backbenches uh, had to say about the concept of a sovereignty act. The Minister of Jobs and Economic Development and Northern Development said the Sovereignty Act is nothing more than, quote, virtue signaling, a, quote, fiscal fairy tale, end quote, that doesn't make any sense and won't work. The Minister of Trade and Immigration and Multiculturalism said that the Sovereignty Act will create, quote, an unconstitutional delusion that will lead the United Conservative Party and Alberta down a dangerous path, end quote. The minister in charge of municipal affairs called it the Anarchy Act, quote, a false dream that will turn into a nightmare, end quote. The minister of finance said the Sovereignty Act would take us backwards because it would create chaos. Mm -hmm. And he also shared a graphic that called the legislation a, quote, ticking time bomb, end quote. Um, the member for sundry Rocky Mountain House called it, quote, very problematic and went on to say that it would break the law, spook the markets, and would be impossible to deliver on. And finally, the member, uh, the current environment minister, uh, environment minister said that the act would, quote, create instability and chaos. It is already doing that. I had international investors concerned about their assets in Alberta asking what was going on with it, end quote. So that is the conversation that preceded the introduction of the act. And, and just to be clear, um, you know, in terms of the uh, members of the legislature um, who ran uh, to lead the government caucus, um, it did turn out that I believe it was 48 point something percent of uh, the government uh, party's membership ultimately voted for every other single candidate than the person who ultimately won. And it's one thing to win a leadership with 52% on the first ballot or the second ballot, but to have to go till you're the last one on the ballot to scrape through 52%, I'm telling you, that says to me that about 48% of even the members of the government party were not in favor of the concept of the Sovereignty Act. So that didn't go out, didn't go along, didn't work out very well for folks. So it's a bit of a mess. And how's it been since then? Well, of course, the, uh, the act was introduced, Mr. Speaker, last uh, Tuesday. It was introduced last Tuesday. Uh, or, and, uh, and debate on it began last Wednesday. And interestingly, by Wednesday, not even 24 hours, after it was actually uh, introduced immediately following uh, reading of the throne speech, Mr. Speaker, the C government caucus was rushing out to provide, quote unquote, clarification. Well, that ought to make the folks over there feel super confident about how well this puppy was thought through. What I will tell you is it certainly did not make investors or Albertans feel confident about it. So obviously, that day and the subsequent day, uh, members of the opposition raised several concerns about the Act. And the first thing that we raised was, of course, the fact that the Act included um, 
this concept, this provision that is often referred to as the uh, Henry VIII Clause, Mr. Speaker. And of course, I know that the Speaker, as a, you know, a, a, a fellow political nerd, fully knows the history of uh, the uh, Henry VIII provision and why we call it that. But, but in, in, in broad terms, it, it relates back to a time in, in parliamentary history in, in, uh, in uh, the UK where the sovereign frustrated that the, the democratic uh, house was uh, limiting his ability to do whatever he wanted came up with a new and creative way to take for himself the ability to make laws and undo laws off of the floor of the Democratic House. And it was a thing that created great conflict in the history of England. And ultimately, uh, I think it took mm, close to a century before eventually uh, the House of Lords and the courts determined that this simply could not go on because it was such an incredible affront to the principles mm -hmm. of democracy and uh, a, an unprecedented overreach in terms of power that was being grasped at by uh, the unelected sovereign. So, anywho, Fast forward several hundred years, and here we were in uh, Edmonton, Alberta, looking at the brand new Premier's number one, Bill One. Woo and that was where she decided to, to kick off her, her tenure. Interesting choice. But what was even more interesting about that choice, Mr. Speaker, and what followed was the profound level of either, on one hand, confusion, or, on the other hand, uh, disturbingly uh, thoughtful efforts to lead this uh, assembly to believe a state of facts which did not align with the language of the act that she was introducing. And so, in fact, I asked her today. So that was one of two things just happened there. Either she was intentionally trying to slide that Henry VIII clause right past members of this assembly without us knowing. Nothing to see here. Don't worry. I'm just going to make assurances one or two times, tell you you don't know what you're reading. It's not in the act. You know that black and white stuff? Black and white are awkward colors. Just ignore them, blur your vision, read into what it is that I meant, trust me, do not read the actual words that appear in the legislation. That's what she said. And was she saying that because she wanted us to not notice that she was doing an unprecedented democratic or undemocratic uh, power grab and democratic overreach? Was that it? Or, and here's the thing, Mr. Speaker, I've been sort of sitting around watching and thinking about this, and I'm only speculating, but I actually believe it was the second thing. I think she literally didn't read her signature bill. I literally think flagship bill, somebody in her office briefed her on it, and she literally didn't read it. She didn't understand what she was introducing, and yet she was perfectly comfortable to go in, come into this legislature and also go out and speak to the media and make confident, arrogant assertions that we didn't understand what the letters in the words on of the paper order is the, called the, 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 the okay. speaker, the, uh, the person speaking just made allegations against a number, another member, not against the party, but against an individual member. Uh, under 23H makes allegations another member and I imputes false motive uh, uh, about motives to another member and Jay uses abusive or insulting language. I, I know the, uh, the honourable member is having a good time revising history, forgetting about the fact that she had a, a minister walk in here with a five-page bill and came in a couple days later with an eight-page amendment. Uh, but I would just be happy if you would just direct the member to stop making, un uh, making unavowed uh, uh, accusations against another member of this House. The Honourable Member for Calgary, Bular McCall. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I think it's not a point of order. Uh, Honourable Member was just uh, going through how the person won the leadership, what they wanted the bill to look like, what they tried to do initially, now they're agreeing to change that bill. That's all in public, all 
part of public record in a matter of debate. And I think earlier the government even clarified that they will be making changes. So we are just talking about things that are on public record and all these things are better of public debate. Agreed. I'm prepared to rule if there's no other comments to be added. Uh, what I would say is, while I'm not going to find this a point of order, I, I would say that the member is being as creative as possible uh, to imply that the uh, Premier was uh, doing something that you're not allowed to do in this house. And uh, she knows that you can't do indirectly what you can't do directly. And so I would just provide some caution there, as well as the use of um, dir what some people might consider direct personal attacks in terms of saying statements like she arrogantly or otherwise certainly sounds directed uh, at the Premier and, and not through the Speaker. So there's a, a few areas of caution that I'm sure the Leader of the Opposition will, take, will heed and proceed. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, well just allow me then uh, to, to clarify, and, and my apologies. I certainly meant only to uh, recount the, the, the history where uh, when I asked the Premier why it was that this type of clause appeared in the Act, the Premier stood up and told me that it did not appear in the Act and then accused me of not having read the Act. Uh, some people might have characterized that as arrogant. We'll leave that to people outside of this building. Um, I will simply say that uh, what we have since seen is that uh, having uh, heard the Premier on multiple fronts outside of this uh, building accuse me of not having read the Act and accusing me of fear-mongering, uh, I now see that the Premier is acknowledging that all of the things that we identified about the Act, or not all the things, but the things about the King Henry VIII Clause, were in fact correct, and that she is now looking at considering amendments <laughs> with respect to that. So what I will say about that, Mr. Speaker, while I don't want to be uh, in any way um, uh, specifically insulting to an individual member, what I will say is this whole uh, saga from uh, last Tuesday to today has engendered a considerable amount of concern amongst a range of opinion leaders and stakeholders across this province as well as across the country about the overall competence of the people upon whom members of the government caucus are relying in order to draft their bills, secure the intentions they claim to be achieving, and to explain to those members what exactly it is that is appearing in the legislation that they introduced in this House last Tuesday. And that, of it, in and of itself, that flip-flop, that failure to acknowledge the provision, Mr. Speaker, in and of itself, se sub separate entirely from the substance itself, is the kind of thing that generates uncertainty and concern. Um, and I believe people mentioned it today in the House on two or three different occasions that we had one national columnist in a national newspaper uh, suggest that the bill had been written in crayon. That, Mr. Speaker, does not engender confidence, not amongst Albertans, not amongst investors, not amongst people across the country. So that's how we got here. And so um, the first thing uh, that we have talked about, uh, or sort of the overarching thing that we have talked about when we talk about this bill, is that as much as we share some of the concerns that originally drove uh, or allegedly originally drove the introduction of this bill, concerns about where uh, certain uh, federal acts may undermine or, or uh, hurt uh, economic growth and job security for many Albertans, that unfortunately the, the cure is worse than the illness in this case because what's happening now is we have a bill that is creating massive economic uncertainty across the country, internationally, and certainly across the province. Now, the first ground for that uncertainty, of course, exists by way of the history that I just outlined, the, the fact that there was such a, a clear uh, um, 
inability of members opposite to describe what it was they were asking the people of this province to uh, uh, give them the authority to do by way of this legislation. The fact that they seemed unaware of what appeared in the legislation, Mr. Speaker. And when you have folks talking about rewriting federal laws arbitrarily in our province relative to the rest of the country, you definitely want to know that you have confidence that those folks know what they're doing, and that certainly is not what we've heard thus far. Now, since then, we've heard from numerous opinion leaders that suggest that this piece of legislation is driving uh, an unacceptable amount of economic uncertainty um, across the province and outside. Um, we've heard from the Chamber of Commerce in Calgary. We've heard from the Canadian Chamber of Commerce. We've heard from CAP. We've heard from uh, the Mayor of Calgary. We've heard from venture capitalists. And very importantly, we have heard from uh, chiefs uh, from Treaty 6 and Treaty 8 who are saying unequivocally that this legislation uh, jeopardizes their fundamental foundational rights. And anybody in this House who has been following the, the uh, long and winding road of getting uh, major economic projects of any type um, built and concluded in this province understand, or in this country, understand that the failure to uh, begin every effort and initiative by speaking <coughs> with and, and gaining um, um, uh, consent uh, from um, Indigenous uh, leadership and respecting treaty rights, they have to understand that that is a recipe for profound economic uncertainty. And yet, once again, Bill 1, the, the Premier's first bill, what does she do? She manages to somehow generate full-throated opposition from uh, uh, leadership in both Treaty 6 and Treaty 8. And that is uh, A, wrong in principle, just because obviously of the principle that we should all be respect respecting treaty rights, and also adds to this concern that I'm identifying around economic uncertainty. Now, we also, um, of course, get uncertainty arising from the questionable nature of the legality of this piece of legislation. So now I'm moving off of the uh, King Henry VIII clause, and I'm moving on to the rest of the clause, and or the rest of the act, and I want to talk just a bit about how much uncertainty is spawned by the fact that there are so many opinions out there with respect to whether it is legal or constitutional. So we've heard that uh, there are a number of constitutional scholars who have primarily identified that they believe, at first glance, that this is going to run into trouble at the, in the courts. Now, there are a couple of exceptions to that rule. Premier herself is identifying them. Uh, former Supreme Court uh, Justice Jack Major, in a very sort of, you know, two-paragraph interview with CBC, said, oh, you know, I don't know, it might not be too bad. And, uh, of course, uh, a, another constitutional scholar from uh, UBC suggested, oh, well, maybe it'll be okay. And, and then, of course, you know, uh, the, uh, the lawyer for the, uh, the convoy protesters thinks it's absolutely constitutional. So there you go there. That's certainly a source you want to be uh, dining out on. But there are a number of other constitutional scholars who um, uh, object to those assertions. And uh, I think we're going to see more and more detailed analyses of exactly why that is. And, I had, and I'm not saying that what I'm about to outline is absolutely accurate, Mr. Speaker. It's just one of several opinions that I've um, heard from uh, well-known constitutional scholars. And so I want to just sort of walk you through uh, one of the, um, the, the concerns that uh, has been relayed to me by a constitutional scholar. And essentially, uh, 
He argues that this whole concept of inviting the legislature to make a determination of constitutionality is in and of itself a breach of Section 96 of the <coughs> Constitution. And Section 96 is the clause which has had uh, a tremendous amount of common law consideration by the courts, which essentially sets out that uh, responsibility is divided between the federal government and the provincial government, and the job of determining which is which rests with the courts. That's what's in Section 96. And by calling upon this legislature to suddenly say, no, nope, we're not uh, uh, going to wait for the courts. We are going to make a decision in place of the courts. We are, in effect, uh, running into some constitutional problems. Now, obviously, a government implicitly makes the determination that their own legislation is constitutional. But for one level of government to offer up opinion about another level of government's constitutionality, that's where, I am told, we run into problems. And that's where we start to run into questions around the rule of law. Well, how, how does that happen, you ask? I know you're asking. You're fully engaged in this conversation. I can tell. Um, how does that happen? Well, the rule of law essentially says that that the, the uh, rule of law essentially says that all people are equal under the law. Individuals are equal under the law. Uh, governments are under the, equal under the law. Organizations are equal under the law. And what that means is that if one organization impinges upon the legal rights of another organization, that second organization or person or level of government must go to the courts in order to have it resolved. And that is, in effect, the rule of law. Or, let's put it another way, if you have two business owners and one business owner breaches a legal contract, the person whose legal contract has been breached has to go to court to get a remedy. That's called the rule of law, Mr. Speaker. Now, vigilante law is the opposite of the rule of law. And what happens there is when one person says, oh, you breached my contract. I'm going to come to your house and take your car. And if you don't like that I took your car, you can take me to court. That's vigilante law. That is in opposition to the rule of law. And that is essentially what this legislation may well be purporting to do on behalf of the government of Alberta. And so this is a, a view of this legislation that uh, has been described to me by a couple of different um, uh, constitutional scholars. Constitutional scholars. So the problem here is that not only are... So we've got this potential constitutional problem, Mr. Speaker, but not only do we have that, we also have the uncertainty that arises from directing agencies to ignore federal order, laws. Order, order. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We have this idea that this act allows the government, the provincial government, to direct a whole series of organizations to just ignore federal laws so that we'd be in a situation where federal laws apply, the other nine provinces, the other three territories, but not in Alberta. Well, nothing says certainty to a potential international investor than that kind of ridiculousness. Nothing. Nothing. So, uh, we have laws that apply elsewhere, but maybe they don't apply here. Well, who don't they apply to? Well, it's only a really small group, is it? Well, not really. Because the legislation is written in such a vague way, it may well be that if you actually just give an organization a grant, the grant, the, the government, provincial government now has the authority to direct that organization to ignore the law. So the question then becomes, you know, who is it that this government will be directing to ignore federal law? So, go back to the emissions cap and um, 
um, C69. And as I said before, we agree. Both of these are, are problems uh, for Alberta industry and, and for many people in, in our province who are looking for a strong economy and for uh, strong job growth. But what I'm trying to figure out is exactly how do we get to the point where this piece of legislation has any impact on either of those two issues. And because the bodies that are subject to those two issues, let's say Suncor, for example, hypothetically, they're not provincial agencies under the Act. I don't know, unless there's some real nefarious stuff going on in the background in terms of people's intentions. I don't know. How is it that they are impacted by this? I don't see it. I am trying to see how you actually get to a place where this act does anything with respect to the problems that it is claiming to fix. Or is it because Suncor got a royalty credit? Are they now somebody that the government can direct to, to, to ignore federal laws? Is that what the act means? I don't know. It's very, very hard to tell. So that kind of uncertainty is very, very worrisome. You know, we just had an announcement, and I think this uh, members uh, opposite were very happy uh, to see that announcement about a joint um, uh, project that was um, introduced uh, or um, going ahead in, in the industrial heartland. It was a uh, transformative uh, problem, or sorry, a transformative project that was focused on uh, net zero and, and hydrogen development. Very exciting. $1.3 billion with air products in, uh, in the uh, industrial heartland. 300 million of that came from the federal government. More than double what the provincial government put in. So, my question is, if I'm Air Products, or if I'm another international investor looking to set up shop in the industrial heartland, looking to get a joint uh, subsidy from the federal government and the provincial government to attract me to come to the industrial heartland to invest billions of dollars, to, to grow the economy, to hire thousands of Albertans, Am I going to do that now with the sovereign Alberta in a united whatever act in play that we may or may not think is legal or not legal, which may or may not be constitutional, which may or may not run afoul of treaty rights, which may or may not direct that very investor to break federal laws with one of the partners they're hoping to get uh, support from? I don't know. To me, that is the recipe for why this so foundationally undermines economic certainty uh, here in this province. So, sorry, you're... Uh, oh, oh, I see. Uh, Welcome to the chamber. Yeah, I know, yeah. It's it's... Thing you can do it order, order. I'm good, I'm good. All right. So, anywho, the other thing, when we talk about how we're not sure about who this applies to and how it would apply, we've heard the Premier talk a lot about the gross injustice of the federal government trying to give uh, Albertans hundreds of millions and over a billion, or in some cases multiple billions of dollars, to support childcare. Now, I'm sure members opposite, you know, will recall that, in my view, properly funded, accessible, high-quality, affordable childcare is probably the singularly most effective economic stimulus any government can ever do anywhere. And now suddenly we have the Premier suggesting that the federal child care agreement is a horrific intrusion into Alberta jurisdiction. Oh my lord, it's awful. The sky is falling. The pearls are clutching. It's awful, Mr. Speaker. And indeed, this may be a place where it will be necessary for the government to use this new act to show the federal government who's boss. Well, what that likely says to me is that we're going to see some delay in rolling out a critically important program that helps 
regular Alberta families deal with out-of-control affordability costs, as well as ensuring that investors see Alberta as a place where they can bring their investment dollars and also their employees because they have a high quality of life and they can get affordable childcare. And now suddenly that is at risk according to the Premier's own description of why it is we need this act. Now, I don't exactly see how it's going to work. Again, we all over here remain very unsure about how this act is actually supposed to work. But since the Premier herself has talked about childcare, Mr. Speaker, I uh, would argue that it's very concerning. So, bottom line is, who does this act apply to? The answer is not clear. The lack of clarity creates uncertainty. Uncertainty freezes investment dollars. Freezing investment dollars slows economic recovery. Therefore, this act and its wide-ranging scope of uncertainty is the exact opposite of what Albertans and the Alberta economy needs right now. Now, let's just talk about this act from the perspective of some of our friends in other parts of the country. It has shocked me, uh, Mr. Speaker, the tunnel vision with which the conversation around this act has occurred uh, throughout the leadership uh, um, contest that we saw with the members opposite uh, and, and, and when they were debating uh, with each other as well as the, the ultimate successor or successor successful candidate, the now Premier, when she was talking about it, there seemed to be this complete failure to understand that we are one of ten provinces and three territories. And presumably, if we succeed in doing this thing with this act, that presumably other provinces will do it too. And we are a landlocked <coughs> province. And Mr. Speaker, I can tell you from personal experience that there were times that if somebody had suggested to the government directly west of us that this was a legitimate tool in their toolbox, they may well have used it. And we would not be 10 months away from the TMX pipeline, first pipeline to Tidewater in over 40 years from Alberta, being completed. Indeed, there was a time, Mr. Speaker, where the then Minister of Environment uh, for the BC government actually started publicly talking about actively refusing to give permits uh, for TMX as it was going forward. And I specifically remember, Mr. Speaker, getting on the phone with a few of the people on that side of the border and walking them through the unconstitutionality of that action, that they literally could not do that, that if they wanted to resist the TMX pipeline being built once the federal government had gone through all the processes that it needed to go through by way of its jurisdictional authority, then the only way they could do that by respecting the rule of law was to go to the courts and ask if they were able to do that. And I remember there being a rather heated three-week period where we were backing and forthing with them and sending them our legal opinions and telling them over and over and over again that they had overstepped and that this was not actually a tool in the so-called toolbox. Thankfully, they ultimately reached, got the same legal advice that we had been sending over there and, you know, having all our flurried, sometimes rather heated conversations over. And instead, they determined that they would take the matter to the courts, which they did. And the court said, yeah, Alberta's right. You cannot refuse to issue permits. This has been done lawfully, and the pipeline will go ahead. If they'd had their version of this act, we would not be 11 months away from having that pipeline built. We would probably be 36 to 48 months away from having that pipeline built. 
and the investment that was needed and attracted by seeing the successful determination of that pipeline being built would not be with us right now. So it shocks me that nobody over there seems to understand the consequences of doing this and creating the uncertainty, not only here, but encouraging other provinces to do the same if we don't have consensus about how to do big projects that cross borders. Yet, not a word over there, not a word. Nobody seems to remember that conversation. Nobody seems to remember that debate. It is so incredibly poorly thought out. So, I'm starting, I'm getting close to wrapping up, Mr. Speaker. I'm sure, sure folks over there will be, will be um, very pleased. But I just want to summarize. The bottom line is this. This is a bill that is, uh, well, I, w I won't quote all the, 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 the extremely critical things that have been said by so many of, of the scholars who have, have um, uh, uh, described it. Members opposite, their own former premier, called it catastrophically stupid, and eh, it's kind of a good short version. It is probably unconstitutional, Mr. Speaker. It is, without question, deeply unclear. And it is already marinated in five or six days of very clearly demonstrated incompetence. All three of those features, Mr. Speaker, undermine the confidence of investors confidence of investors in Calgary, the confidence of investors in Toronto, the confidence of investors in New York, the confidence of New York investors in London. It makes us look ridiculous. And it also undermines our ability to kickstart that economic growth which so many Albertans are counting on. So it doesn't help business, it hurts business. We've already reviewed the fact that most Albertans do not believe this is a necessary or advisable tool to use to defend Albertans' interests. So Albertans are not behind it. And Mr. Speaker, the one thing that I haven't had a chance to fully talk about too much yet, but I will touch on very briefly, all the time that we spend talking about this ridiculous yeah. act is time that we do not spend talking about the real crises that are facing Albertans. Last week, we tried to have an emergency debate about the crisis in children's health care. Today, after hearing over the weekend, Mr. Speaker, about how uh, a children's hospice that took care of palliative patients and took care of exceptionally medical medically fragile children and gave respite to their exhausted parents, how the staff working there were redirected to deal with the crisis that is occurring in our hospitals. And the Minister of Health got up and said, oh, it's not so bad, it's just as bad everywhere else. Well, actually, Mr. Speaker, it's not just as bad everywhere else. And also, on top of it, uh, he then went on to say, we're not going to talk about it. And also, we're not going to talk about your bill. Your, your bill won that rather than engaging in all this economic chicanery, would actually engage us all in a thoughtful conversation about how to come together to make our healthcare system better for people not only in downtown Calgary and downtown Edmonton, but also people in northern Alberta and southern Alberta, in Lethbridge, in Medicine Hat, in the Bow Valley, in Red Deer, in communities all between. That's what we should be talking about, Mr. Speaker. That is what our bill would have allowed us to do. And instead, members opposite decided to use their majority in a way I've never seen before to completely undermine the rights of private members who are not part of the government caucus and to avoid speaking about that issue. And that is relevant to this bill because we are spending so much time talking about this bill, which is an attack on our economy, and we are not spending our time talking about the things that Albertans are desperate to hear us focus on. 
We have a volunteer chief medical officer of health. We have school boards being told that, that, that they can't keep their kids safe. We have teachers who are overwhelmed by class sizes and illnesses. We have affordability crises that are, that are hurting uh, Alberta families and, and a, a complete failure to engage in any long-term solutions with respect to those. Um, we have very serious concerns, Mr. Speaker. And also, we have an economy that is in desperate need of thoughtful efforts to diversify and to innovate and to grow long-term, sustainable, resilient jobs. But instead, what are we doing? We're ignoring the health care crisis. We're ignoring the crisis in education. We're ignoring the number of kids that are getting sick right now. We're ignoring the affordability crisis. We are ignoring our obligation to grow the economy. Instead, what we are doing, what was it, 15,000 jobs lost last month, I think? Yeah. Instead, what are we doing? We are spending all our time fighting about a poorly written, incompetently written, unconstitutional, unclear uh, a, economy upending piece of legislation that has been characterized by many as the worst piece of legislation introduced into this House in 90 years, Mr. Speaker. So, for that reason, there is no way that we can support this bill, and I would urge members opposite, urge them to take it back to the drawing board, to restore a semblance of good governance, to listen to uh, Indigenous leaders who so desperately want their treaty rights to be respected, to listen to business folks who want the chaos to stop and instead to focus on the issues that Albertans really care about, Mr. Speaker. The time is long past for that to be the work that this government does instead of spending time with this bill. Thank you. On amendment RA1, are there others? The Honourable Member for Edmonton Manning would like to join in the debate. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And it is a uh, honor to rise and speak to the referral amendment um, that this bill not be read a second time as it negatively impacts the investment decisions in Alberta's economy and should not proceed in order to protect the economic well-being of Albertans. Now, we've had many discussions over the last few days in regards to what we're hearing. Um, on this side of the house about this piece of legislation and it's only been a couple days and yet we've seen investor after investor business owner whether it be big business small business um, international investors coming forward and saying that this bill is creating such uncertainty in the future of Alberta and the future of our economy that they're concerned about being able to bring investment into the province. Now, you know, I, I find it very interesting when I look at some of the commentary that's come forward from people that, as you know, the Premier had, had said in one of her questions, are, are not typical allies of the NDP, and yet they agree with what we're saying because ultimately it is just common sense. And so, to continue to have this debate, to continue to try to encourage the government to recognize that a mistake was made, and you know, it's, it's good to come back and say, you know what, we made a mistake, we should throw this bill out, and we should really focus on what matters to Albertans, would be a step probably in the right direction for this government. But over the last, I would say, three and a half years, and it doesn't matter if you have a new leader or an old leader, the behavior hasn't changed. The government continues to push forward on their agenda, ignoring the issues that really matter to the very people of this province. We've been talking about on this side of the house the affordability crisis, talking about the concerns around health care, asking the government to support Albertans when it comes to trying to pay their bills for a year and a half. 
I have videos that my staff lovely just post throwbacks for me this week of me asking at budget of last year, flagging the fact that we were seeing an inflationary crisis happening, seeing the fact that natural gas prices were going up, that gas was going up, looking at the fact that electricity costs were going up, and yet this government did nothing. And so an opportunity prevents itself. New leader, new session, let's introduce new pieces of legislation. And what does the government do? Introduces a piece of legislation that creates economic uncertainty and completely ignores the issues that Albertans are talking about. How do I pay my bills? How do I have a good paying job? Is the economy stable? And who's taking care of my children at the local hospital? None of that is in here. And in fact, we even heard today, and I'm going to quote this, Mr. Speaker, from a former um, comms director for the Honourable Prime Minister Harper, as well as campaign director for the current Premier in Ontario. And I quote, well, I know this was part of a leadership campaign commitment and playing to a portion of the Conservative base in Alberta. But you know, there are a few challenges. One, it's not broadly supported by Albertans. And so it baffles me as a campaign manager why they would put this as Bill 1 and put it so front and centre in an election campaign, a re-election campaign that is just around the corner. This, this is so off topic and I don't know how you can fix this bill because, or why you would want to, because it's fundamentally unconservative. You're trying to pass a piece of legislation to make another level of government respect the constitutional constitution more by doing something that is profoundly unconstitutional in itself. Like, I don't know how you square that circle. I think there's, I think the UCP and Albertans are on the right track in saying the federal government is overreaching on a number of issues around the resource sector, but where they're acting in an unconstitutional way, that's heavy handed. But the solution to an unconstitutionality is not more unconstitutionality like you know. I think this is going to go down in history as one of the most ill-conceived pieces of policy and legislation. And frankly, as a conservative, I, am prof I find this profoundly unconservative. I quote. So from many of your lovely <laughs> colleagues who find it very unconservative, um, it's a quote. And it's a quote from the Honourable Comms Director for former Premier, or Prime Minister Harper. Pretty interesting uh, quote, I would say. I think the government is having a crisis. And maybe we could even say it might be an identity crisis. Don't quite know where they belong. Even their own entrenched people who have had long histories of working within the conservative movement are calling this piece of legislation unconservative. As a libertarian, for those who are libertarians on that side, I don't know how you understand this piece of legislation and that it even resonates with your fundamental beliefs. It is such a significant overreach. So there's that piece. There is an identity crisis that I think that this current government is having. Now, on top of that though, I have spent, since this bill was introduced, calling stakeholders, long conversations, great weekend really, having a lovely chat about where people think they're headed, what's going to happen with um, their future investments, what they're concerned about. And you know, I haven't heard a single person say that they're okay with this piece of legislation. In fact, all I've heard is there's so much uncertainty, I don't know what this means, I don't know if this is going to impact my international trade. I don't know if this is going to impact my export markets. I don't know um, if this is going to have serious impact on me being able to attract more investment into the sector. And in fact, it actually will impact the competitiveness between Alberta, Saskatchewan and Manitoba when it comes to our agriculture industry. Because why? would investors come to Alberta when they see a government choosing to continue to talk about the what ifs or we don't agree when they can go to Manitoba and not have to worry about two governments who are deciding that they're not that they're going to fight with each other. One of the best quotes I actually heard or one of the best things that was said to me by one of my stakeholders today actually 
was the best thing for our economy is a stable economy and a stable democracy. It's not stable, Minister. I appreciate that, that it's a great quote. It's, it's, it's actually, I totally agree. To have a great, strong economy, we need to have a stable economy and we need to have a stable democracy. This does not incite a stable democracy. It doesn't. And so because it doesn't in, in, encourage and show the investment community that we have a stable democracy in this province, it creates economic uncertainty. It just it naturally does. We saw the same thing happening with Quebec, and the minister might want to cheer that on too. But if you look at their bonds and what happened with their bonds when they started to get into the whole sovereignty discussion, Ontario bonds were at 10, Quebec's had to go up to 17, and it took forever for their bonds to drop back down. There were significant economic impacts that were happening in the jurisdiction of Quebec during the discussion around what they were planning on doing. Small businesses were impacted. Local markets were impacted in Quebec because they didn't know if they were going to be able to get their markets outside of the province. They didn't have the same relationships ar around who they were going to be exporting, even from an interprovincial perspective, because their local markets started to shrink because nobody knew what was going to happen to the local economy. There was a ton of uncertainty. Would you like to interject? <laughs> Go ahead. Yes. I was using that <laughs> key word to catch your attention. And my concern is about the specific clauses of the law, of, of this potential law, but just really the concept. And I'm glad you were speaking about um, other jurisdictions that went through this process. And I know that. <clears throat> of course, initially people would say, well, if Quebec was trying to separate. But, you know, the sovereignty law that they did bring forward in 1976, right, was a precursor to that continuum towards a uh, referendum on separation. Now, we're not necessarily saying that that's happening here, although I have my doubts, right? Um, but just the word putting in a sovereignty act into place, right, um, triggers a whole series of decisions that businesses will make. And uh, once that moves, then something else moves. It's almost like a glacier melting. And I'm just wondering in the agriculture sector if you've reflected on how that might affect uh, that industry. Well, uh, thank you, Honorable Member, for the question. You know, in relation to the agriculture industry, I think one of the things that, and you know, I, I wish we've had, we had heard from the minister in regards to this piece of legislation, which we haven't as of yet, and, and maybe he, he will be able to speak to it at some point, is specific to agriculture is that it's so intertwined with the federal government. There are many regulations and policies that overlap. A lot of the investment that comes into Alberta comes through federal grants. Um, and supports the irrigation project, which this government continues to, to re-announce and re-announce about doing more irrigation and saying it was them, was actually funded primarily by the federal government. And so there are many projects and many relationships that exist um, between the current province, well, between the province and the federal government. When we start looking at even trying to champion our international markets, we know when there's volatility in our democracy, when things are said out of context, our international partners will shut down their trade borders. We've seen it with pulses, we've seen it with our beef market, we've seen it with our pork exports. When we are not working in collaboration between all levels of government, we will impact those, inter those international markets. And again, I haven't heard from the, the minister as to how he's planning on protecting those international uh, markets, how he's ensuring that those relationships will continue, and how <clears throat> excuse me, he will continue to champion the agriculture sector when it comes to things about our food safety. CFIA currently is the one that is required to ensure that our food is inspected. It is a federally regulated program. It requires and works in collaboration across interprovincial jurisdictions so that we can sell our product to other markets, whether it be BC, whether it be Ontario, and whether it be international. Now, the reason that those systems work are because there is an understanding both nationally and internationally about what our products do. 
and how they're regulated and how they are monitored and how we ensure that our food is safe. Now, we've seen already in the letter from the Premier to the Minister talking about looking at different mechanisms around uh, food quality and monitoring. Uh, and also in the, the mandate letter, we saw uh, a direction where we should be looking at trying to get pre-clearance for exports. That's going to require some relationship building. That's going to require the minister to work in collaboration with federal counterparts to be able to develop those things. Now, does that create economic uncertainty when we see a government saying, well, we don't want to work on those things or we don't want to work in collaboration? Does that create a stable democracy? Absolutely not. It does not. And it also makes it very difficult to have adult conversations and to try to get things done. And agriculture and forestry, for that matter, when we start looking at the softwood lumber dispute and looking at our trade agreements with the United States, those things have to be done across intergovernmental relationships. They have to be. So, you know, have we heard that CAP's not happy about this bill? Yes, we have. Have we heard the Chamber of Commerce say the same thing, whether it be the Canadian Chamber of Commerce or the Calgary Chamber of Commerce? We absolutely have. But what we're waiting for, and what I hope to hear from this government is, how are they protecting our border in the sense of making sure that our market are open? That our products are not going to be impacted by the decisions that this government is making under this piece of legislation. That motions that are being drafted according to the Premier by ministers isn't somehow going to prevent the market and our products to get to markets through the international markets or even our local markets. Because it's complicated. It's not as simple as saying, well, we disagree, we don't like what you're doing and therefore we're going to stop it. We know that doesn't work for dairy, it doesn't work for chicken, it doesn't work for beef, it doesn't work for pork. And now when we're trying to look at value add with the agri-food industry, trying to encourage investment to come to Alberta and not Saskatchewan and not Manitoba is going to become a struggle if we continue to see this piece of legislation the way that it is. So I won't support it, Mr. Speaker, because I actually believe that there is going to be significant economic impacts that none of the ministers have been able to mitigate and have been able to explain to the rest of us in this house how that's not going to impact the economic investment opportunities that we've been working so hard to make sure are coming to Alberta. I believe in a diversified economy. I believe in diversifying our egg sector and that value add and that egg reprocessing. Member? Yes. Thank you for accepting the intervention, member. Because I know that over the summertime you did uh, an extensive consultation going to many rural communities, meeting with many rural stakeholders, both economic, agricultural producers. You really <clears throat> reached out to so many of them. And I want to applaud you for that work because I know it's an, a considerable investment of your time, right? And uh, you did it gracefully um, by connecting with so many. And I mean, you alluded to this already in your statements, but I, I was hoping that you could discuss a little bit further about what, what the impacts this bill will have on those communities, those stakeholders, and uh, the people that we're, we're supposed to be here representing. Well, thank you, Member. I, you know, one of the things that, that I enjoy most about my job is being able to go um, outside of Edmonton and go into rural communities, and I think Part of it is, is that I come from a small town and so I'm really passionate about making sure that our smaller communities have a strong and vibrant, vibrant economy. Now, what do we know about Alberta? Well, most of our smaller economies are driven by our resource sector, whether it be oil and gas, whether it be forestry and whether it be agriculture. And we need to ensure that those economies continue to thrive and that those economies continue to be able to be good paying jobs for our, our local smaller communities. And, and I'm, I won't lie, I'm worried about what it's going to do. If we don't see the investment coming into those communities, if we don't see the value added processing, if we don't see oil and gas companies investing, if we don't see our green tech companies investing, greenhouses for that, for that matter, looking at expanding their, their 
um, businesses in these local economies, we're going to see a retraction. And I don't want to see a retraction in the smaller communities. I believe that supporting smaller towns where people can grow up, raise their kids, and continue to work there is what we should be doing. And so, you know, I think this act has a significant issue in, in sending us the wrong signal when it comes to that piece. Now, as you know, my, my leader also mentioned, I do think it also ignores a major conversation that's also happening. I think all members of this, this chamber will acknowledge, no matter what community you come from, that healthcare is a problem. Rural Alberta healthcare is a significant issue. That we can't recruit doctors, getting nurses out there. We're hearing of emergency rooms being shut down. We just had the recent story of the individual from Lac La Biche that had to come down into Edmonton for dialysis because the dialysis clinic is full. And so there is a significant problem that needs to be addressed. And that should be the fundamental priority for this government. Not a bill that actually doesn't do anything for the people that elected us to be here. Doesn't drive our economy, ensure doesn't address health care and really doesn't address the affordability issue. It ignores all of those things. It is a sad bill one, and it's kind of a mess. And I would really encourage the government to retract it and to refocus and make their bill one about fixing health care, make their bill one about the affordability mechanisms that they're telling us they're gonna do. Figure something else out that actually speaks to the people of this province, because right now, the majority of Albertans do not support this bill. And I think that is the fundamental issue here, is that the government is offside with the rest of Albertans. I might just take this opportunity to remind members that we are on Amendment RA1 and that they ought to be speaking to the amendment and not the main motion. Looks like the Honourable Member for Edmonton Ellerslie is rising. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I want to take this opportunity to, to just provide uh, this legislature and all the members within, of course, through you, Mr. Speaker, to all the members, just a caution. Now, I know that it's not the intention of anybody in this house to encourage Albertans to break the rule of law. I know it's not the intention of the members in this house to do so. But I want to draw people's attention back to, at the federal level, what were conservative policies that did, maybe it wasn't the intention of the people who actually brought those policies into, into the parliament to, to encourage people to do damage and, and hurt people and ultimately kill people. But when the niqab ban was presented, when the barbaric cultural practices hotline was presented, they were presented as ideas. So the word of caution that I want us to really consider when it comes to Sovereignty Act, and we've already seen it, Mr. Speaker, at the Coots border. Now I know none of the members on the other side, again, would actually encourage Albertans to break the law. I know that. Never mind actually commit a crime that would actually lead to the death of, of an individual. But what we did see there, Mr. Speaker, were people that were armed, and we're actually going to make a move towards being violent. Now, you're asking, okay, well, why am I bringing up the niqab ban? Why am I bringing up the barbaric cultural practices ban? Because what I'm getting at here, Mr. Speaker, is that the policies and ideas that we present within legislatures and parliaments have a particular impact on the general population. So just a word of caution there. <clears throat> the rhetoric that gets exposed inside of the legislature could potentially lead to acts that we 
Of course, we by no means are intending for those things to happen. And I'm bringing this up because when the London family was, was killed, I, made, I gave a, uh, a caution at that time. And I said it's the rhetoric that happens inside of the house, the political rhetoric, that then has an impact on the general population. And then they go out and they act on particular ideas of their own. Now, this to me is what I would, I would consider that we'd be concerned about when we, when we debate regarding Bill 1. Because that's in the back of my head. I will I'll admit, Mr. Speaker, that, that it is a concern of mine. But getting uh, more to the point and to the reasoned amendment and why I do not support Bill 1, I would say that, and it's nothing new, Mr. Speaker, because we've seen it with a number of pieces of legislation that have been brought inside of the House. And that is that this government, whether it be under the previous leader, and now we're seeing the same thing with the current leader, is that they're concentrating more power in the hands of ministers. And that I find that is very concerning. Because the, that action in itself is anti-democratic. It's an action that is actually eroding democratic uh, principles, dem our democratic values that we have here in Alberta, by actually putting more and more hands in the power of ministers. And not only yeah, that, uh, Mr. Speaker, but the Act allows a member of Cabinet to bring a resolution to the Assembly that states that a federal initiative is unconstitutional or causes harm or is anticipated to cause harm. And of course, the Leader of the Opposition went uh, spoke uh, briefly about this particular aspect, and that is something that is decided by the courts. You know, we, you know, it's... Whenever I have the chance to go visit schools, uh, we, we always cover, especially for the grade six students, the executive, the legislative, and the judicial, all those different levels and how they all work together and actually to make sure that our democracy functions <clears throat> properly, making sure that the rule of law is observed. And, no, and especially, Mr. Speaker, that we're all equal under the law. Now, I know that we have a long way to go. There's a number of issues with our judicial system. Some people get more representation than others. You know, uh, I'm sure that uh, members of this house, when it comes to actually seeing the, the experience of Indigenous people, and you know, I'm going to get in a little bit more into that with this particular bill, uh, they don't necessarily have equal representation under the law. And on that note, Mr. Speaker, this particular bill, when it was being uh, put together, Indigenous people weren't even consulted on this particular bill. And we've heard extensively from the member of Edmonton Rutherford, who's been contacted by members of Treaty 6 and Treaty 8, about how that consultation process never took place. And it's my understanding that the, the Minister of Justice doesn't want to even entertain the idea that this is something that should happen when it comes to this particular bill. So when it comes to the Minister of Indigenous Relations, I'm asking myself, well, is he advocating on behalf of Indigenous people when it comes to this here particular bill so that it truly can be more democratic? Correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Speaker, but we should be learning from the mistakes that we've made in the past. And the whole, the whole, uh, the reality that we've gone through a process of 
truth and reconciliation. And I'll remind members of the House that the whole process of truth and reconciliation is that you have to face the truth. You have to face the truth of what has happened in the history of Canada. You have to face it. And if you really want to make a change, sure, I'll see to the member from the other side. Thank you. Well, the, the government whip. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Facing the truth, I would like to understand the member's position on subsection, well, section two interpretation. Quote, nothing this act shall be construed as A, authorizing any order uh, would be contrary to the Constitution of Canada, B, authorizing any director of person, person other than provincial entity that would compel a person to act contrary to the violation, uh, otherwise in violation of federal law, or C, abrogating or derogating from any existing Aboriginal and treaty right of Aboriginal peoples of Canada that are recognized and affirmed by Section 35 of the Constitution Act 1982. So looking for constructive criticism here, that is like point blank clear in terms of what this law should be interpreted as. What is the constructive criticism facing the truth that you'd like to see other than absolute black and white clear print that this will be constitutional and it will not abrogate or derogate from the rights of those individuals in section 35. Again, uh, Mr. Mr. Speaker, Lee, I j just point out behind you as well, the Honourable Member for Edmonton Rutherford is rising. But Go ahead. Uh, Thank you. I'd just like to take an opportunity to intervene in the conversation because I know that um, you are very concerned about responding to the question that was just asked and um, it gives me a good opportunity to uh, to reiterate some of the I'm sorry to reiterate some of the uh, things that we have discussed about the fact that uh, uh, Chief uh, Tony Alexis for example has consulted with his lawyers and they have very clearly said that section 2c does not in fact eliminate everything else that happens in the act and I, I think you know that, but it, you know, I feel it's important to be able to respond to the question uh, that uh, the, the, the um, section in 2C talks about uh, the desire for people not to assume that that's what's going to happen. But then when you go on to actually do something, it doesn't matter if you say, well, I'm not trying to insult you, sir, if you go on to then insult them. Uh, you know, we see this happening all, all the time, uh, you know, in our, our normal dialogue, and I, I know that you know that... Uh, uh, this is what is being told to the chiefs, that the act itself belies the thing that is being said in 2C. The Honourable Member. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member from Edmonton Rutherford for sharing uh, the, the particular response of an Indigenous leader to the bill. How about your response? And my response is the fact that the bill itself says one thing in one place, but doesn't uh, not, doesn't necessarily address it further on. And this, is, and this is characteristically, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, this is characteristically the attitude of mainly conservative governments throughout several jurisdictions in, uh, in this country when it comes to dealing with First Nations communities and leaders they think that they know it all. So there's no need to consult with Indigenous leaders at all. They know it all, so they're just going to, to uh, move forward the way that they like without even consulting Indigenous leaders. Now, if they would have consulted with Indigenous leaders, Mr. Speaker, then perhaps we'd have uh, uh, a bill that at least you could say, okay, well, they consulted with the Indigenous leaders, but we don't even have that, Mr. Speaker. Right? And again, I go back to the, the whole issue at hand is that, again, we see that, and, and, and I'm reminded, Mr. Speaker, that, yeah, members on the other side, when, then, when this bill was actually presented, we're, we were saying, hey, this allows the Premier herself to go in behind closed doors with her cabinet and actually make legislation and not even have to bring it into the House. And, and then, and then the, the members on the other side, oh, well, you, they're claiming that we didn't even read the, the bill, Mr. Speaker. And then now we have members on the other side, including the Premier herself, saying, okay, yeah, yeah, we're going to have to introduce some amendments here in order to make this change. But the whole idea, Mr. Speaker, 
The whole idea of this bill gives no confidence to the people of Alberta that this government knows what they're doing and how it's actually going to impact communities when it comes to the rule of law. Now, Mr. Speaker, you know, uh, several members on this side of the House have, have, uh, have already spoken to stakeholders uh, that have spoken out against the Sovereignty Act already. You know, there's the Calgary Chamber President and CEO, uh, Deborah Yedlin, who said in an interview, there's no shred of evidence that this act will lead to economic growth. You can't tell me this is going to support economic growth and support continued economic diversification in this province. Right? The CEO, Lisa Baton, uh, of uh, uh, the Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers, we are concerned about any government policy that has the potential to create uncertainty for investors. And this is, in fact, creating uncertainty. Now, the members on the other side, they know just as well as I do that when it comes to venture capitalists, when it comes to attracting capital to the province of Alberta, they're looking at the strength of our economy. They're looking at, at a policy that will actually make it more of a secure investment for them. They want it to be as much of a sure thing as possible. And this particular bill doesn't do any of that. It doesn't do any of that because at, at the end of the day, you know, you want a piece of legislation that is, uh, or, you know, is going to, um, a policy that is going to encourage uh, the industry to be lucrative and productive. And yes, here I am talking about oil and gas. You know, like the members on the other side of the, of the house like to, uh, li like to talk about how we're not supporters of oil and gas when we were the ones who uh, advocated very firmly, Mr. Speaker, advocated very firmly for the Trans Mountain Pipeline. Trying to bring all stakeholders to the table in order to make the Trans Mountain Pipeline a reality. And very early on, very early on, our leader of the Alberta NDP requested Indigenous people, Indig First Nations communities, representatives, leaders, environmentalists, uh, CEOs uh, in the petroleum uh, industry, all to come together, all to come together and sit down and be like, okay, how can we get this thing done? And the magic word there, Mr. Speaker, is cooperation, is bringing all the stakeholders together and having them cooperate. How can we make this a reality? How can we get the Trans Mountain Pipeline done? And from what I've seen over the last three years, Mr. Speaker, is a government that rather than create the conditions for cooperation between different levels of government, between different stakeholders, between different indigenous communities, rather than create cooperation, they're creating division. We should be working towards unity Oh, and I see that I have uh, the member from West Hende would like to make an intervention, which I will accept, Mr. Speaker. Well, thank you, <clears throat> Mr. Speaker. And whether it's, uh, you know, members of this side of the House raising the issue, whether it's the uh, many constitutional experts or uh, investors who have come forward, as the member was just speaking to, uh, again and again, beyond, you know, ensuring that um, 
<clears throat> we are creating a, an environment where uh, there is incentives to, to be here, whether it's through taxation, whether it's through grants and um, otherwise. Uh, the fact is we need the rule of law to prevail. And unfortunately, going back to what the member uh, on the other side of the House, you know, looking under interpretation, what we see in here in, in Section 2, that uh, nothing in this Act can be strewed as, uh, construed as A, authorizing any order that would be contrary to the Constitution of Canada. And again, I would go back to the idea that just because you write it here does not make it so. And going further to page 7 in, in section 8, that no cause of action lies against and no action or proceeding may be commenced against, and it goes on to talk about uh, crowns or agencies um, that are within this act that may take action that might be contrary to uh, the Constitution because of a decision that was made uh, through motion. Oh, <laughs> didn't quite get there. <laughs> but how important is Yes, thank you, uh, uh, member from West End Day. And, you know, uh, I think that the best way to, to answer that would be to actually quote Emmett McFarlane, who called it the most unconstitutional bill in Canada's modern history. Uh, you know, uh, economics uh, prof Trevor Toome also pointed out to legislation under Bill Eberhardt to, to disagree, but modern history in the constitutional context means uh, that you know, that upon the passing of such a, a resolution, Bill 1 gives a free hand to the government to change any law on the books and to order provincial entities, which include any provincial agencies or institutions, municipalities, universities, and even the police, to ignore or violate federal law and even criminal law. And again, Mr. Speaker, I go back to my opening statement providing this legislature and all the members within it, through you, of course, Mr. Speaker, that we need to be careful. We need to be absolutely careful in our debate what, and what we are suggesting. Uh, your intention may not be, but there are particular individuals in our society that will hear one thing and they'll go out and they'll act on it and they will <coughs> erode, erode our rule of law. On amendment RA1, the honorable member for Edmonton Riverview. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And it's my pleasure to join the debate on Bill 1. And uh, of course, we're on amendment uh, RA1, a reasoned amendment, and I'll be speaking uh, uh, in support of this amendment. And certainly, uh, you know, we've heard uh, far and wide from uh, the business uh, community, Indigenous leaders, academics, journalists, and even elected representatives from the governing party that the Sovereignty Act is legislation that will hurt Albertans. So even, you know, members of uh, uh, their own caucus, the UCP who presented this bill, have spoken publicly denouncing it. Uh, besides hurting our business sector by creating significant uncertainty, which has already been created, fe we've created some fear amongst investors. We've already heard from investors saying that uh, with this kind of legislation, that creates instability. And of course, we know businesses thrive when there's stability. And so, I know, sort of, I, I'm kind of confused by the UCB who, who declare themselves, uh, you know, champions for business, that they would actually move to create this instability in uh, the economy, in the business community. And it's not just us that are saying, it's uh, business leaders themselves, chambers of commerce, the Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers, so uh, it, it, it is illogical, really, Mr. Speaker, so it's hard to understand why. But the official opposition, I just want to highlight, uh, did something we rarely do when bills are introduced, and that is uh, uh, we voted against the uh, first reading. By convention, we generally vote in favor of first reading of bills. We, however, did not do this on the, uh, in our first reading because we knew this bill was so deeply flawed, we voted against it. 
And since doing so, the Albertans, Canadians that I've just mentioned at the outset have spoken far and wide supporting that action. You know, it, people across this country see uh, how deeply flawed this bill and how it needs to not pass. And that is, of course, why I'm speaking in support of the reasoned amendment. So just for a bit of history, I just thought it'd be interesting to share with the legislature. We voted against first reading of two other bills during this 30th uh, session of the Legislative Assembly. The first one was Bill 9, a Public Sector Wage Arbitration Deferral Act. Just to remind members of the Assembly, uh, in short, Bill 9 imposed a delay on wage talks for frontline workers who took pay freezes in the first years of their contracts and then had the right to reopen pay negotiations within a, with arbitration if needed in 2019. Because of this egregious betrayal that the UCP leveled against AUP members employed at Alberta Health Services, the Government of Alberta, post-secondary education boards and agencies, the NDP caucus voted against first reading of Bill 9, just like we're doing today. Because again, it was a deeply flawed, deeply troubling uh, bill, and uh, so we stood together that that shouldn't even go in front of the legislature. Uh, at all. But just to remind you some more about Bill 9, just to add salt to the wound of this significant betrayal of workers, Premier Kenny at the time handed out earplugs <coughs> to the members of his caucus during the debate in the legislature. And, uh, you know, many things were said about that, but one of the things that I want to say it was just a very stunning show of disrespect. Well, here we are all these years later, and Jason Kenney is no longer the Premier. Despite his profession that he wanted a legislative decorum, he stoked disrespect of the public discourses. Indeed. Saying one thing and doing another. And uh, certainly there's a word that we all know for this type of behavior. So that is another situation when we uh, voted against first reading, like we have done for Bill 1. And uh, again, I just want to reiterate, that's why I think it's important that we uh, support the reasoned amendment. And I, and I did say that we had it done it two previous times, so then the second time we'd done it before was we voted against first reading uh, in this 30th legislature, Bill 22, Reform Agencies, Board and Commissions, and Government Enterprises Act 2019. The key concern we had with this bill and uh, wanting it to, uh, was that uh, the bill terminated the contract of Alberta's election commissioner, Lauren Gibson. He was in the midst of an investigation into allegations of illegal donations in the 2017 UCP leadership race. We were assured that the investigation would continue by Premier Kenny, but what actually happened is that everything went dark. In fact, some members may remember that the leader of the official opposition was removed from this chamber because she accused the government of obstructing justice by firing the election commissioner. So these are two very significant uh, examples of our NDP caucus voting against uh, previous legislation in this 30th legislature because those bills were so egregious. And I absolutely stand with uh, the decisions of my caucus regarding that. And we have done that again. We did that on uh, uh, Throne Speech Day, which was November 29th, yes. yes. And uh, against this Sovereignty uh, Act, Bill 1, because it's hard to sort of top some of what I've just articulated but this Bill 1 is going to create much more havoc and much more distress, although these bills obviously created significant uh, difficulties for workers, really uh, a deep betrayal of an agreement the government had with members of the Alberta Union of Provincial Employees and just uh, created new legislation to override that. And uh, then, of course, the second one is, you know, an investigation into their own um, allegations of 
uh, improper donations, uh, you know, taking out the person who is doing the investigation, taking away their job. So these are uh, pretty significant uh, uh, things that Albertans should be definitely very concerned about. And, and sadly, uh, this government is continuing to uh, do things that are hurting our province, are hurting Albertans. And uh, so uh, that is why our caucus stood so strongly and uh, voted extraordinarily against the first reading of Bill 1. And I must say, it is also a significant concern of mine, as had been, has been shared by my, pre, my previous colleagues, is that why would this be the Bill 1 in this Legislative Assembly? There are so many uh, significant issues going on in Alberta. We know that uh, our health care system is in crisis, and sadly it seems the decisions being made by the UCP government are only making it worse you know, accusing uh, the, uh, you know, AHS of manufacturing, uh, you know, uh, an issue with staffing and uh, firing the board, putting in sort of uh, a UCP uh, supporter to uh, be an administrator, and I'm sure that he won't have much power in his position, but will be doing exactly what the cabinet tells him to. So there's so many key issues that need to be addressed. And so that is definitely why I think it's very important for us to uh, support this reasoned amendment. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. um, would you accept an intervention? Yes, I will. From myself? Yes. Well, thank you. From you. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I, I really appreciate your comments generally. And it's, um, I think, constructive to look at the history of um, using, um, you know, a, a, cho a choice to vote on first reading um, with, uh, you know, potential laws that um, affect Albertans. And I know you have particular expertise in regards to seniors and housing, and I don't, quite frankly, but uh, I'm very interested to learn more. And I know that many of those projects that we look for in perhaps infrastructure, but specifically focused and pointed to seniors in housing, um, would be um, a, a, a joint uh, venture between uh, the provincial government and the federal government. And so I'm sure you've kind of thought about, you know, how this antagonistic and uh, arbitrary Bill 1 would uh, potentially affect um, housing projects uh, going in, down in the future for Albertans, and, um, you know, what uh, can we do to mitigate that? Besides, of course, killing the bill. Right. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much for uh, the intervention. And certainly, yes, that, that is a concern. And of course, we know that in the throne speech at the sort of the end of the last page or so, um, uh, the UCP did talk about some programs uh, that uh, they thought that the federal government had too much interference in, in their own... Um, you know, in the provincial jurisdiction, they identify health care, they identify child care, they in, uh, identify education. These are just three examples. They don't say housing, but it could easily be housing. And I, I mean, one of the uh, major concerns I have, uh, certainly as the former minister of seniors and housing, is just the lack of, uh, you know, investment, lack of action on that file at all. And I have met with stakeholders across the province and people needing affordable housing. And, you know, the province is just missing in action. There's no investment. They did do a report, but nothing has really happened. Nothing has changed. So people are going ahead without the province because the province isn't there. Municipalities, uh, different nonprofits are working directly with the federal partners. Will that be outlawed by this bill? Will that be not allowed? If that means projects won't go ahead, and we know that Alberta has, uh, you know, we don't even have average uh, access to affordable housing. It's uh, provincially uh, across Canada. It's about 4.3%, but in Alberta, we only have 2.9% of affordable housing. We need so much more. And what 
so this bill could really jeopardize and put us even further behind. And I'm, uh, I'm hoping the minister is thinking about these questions and, you know, addressing them with his colleagues, with the cabinet, because we need investment in these areas. And uh, will this bill mean that the uh, UCP is going to tell people who are wanting to work with the federal government, no, you can't do that because, you know, they shouldn't be mucking around in our stuff or whatever. So that uh, is a, a huge issue. And I mean, this is just one scenario and one of the reasons why we should um, support this reasoned amendment uh, and make sure that this uh, bill uh, does not uh, go ahead. So uh, my colleague, when he asked me about uh, the question about, for example, housing, seniors housing maybe more particularly, he sort of led me to uh, look at sort of, you know, the three sort of key issues, I think, with this bill. And uh, my colleagues have spoken at length about uh, issues, but I'll just do a quick a summary and highlight some of the things that I've seen and they've articulated as well. So we already know about the Henry VIII clause, which is actually uh, section four of the act. And this gives extraordinary powers to executive council. It, uh, if the legislative assembly approves a resolution brought forward by a minister, then the Executive Council then has the powers to suspend or amend that legislation. This limits democracy, which I've heard the members opposite say on so many occasions is of utmost importance to them. So that behind closed doors in Executive Council, they'll be making decisions that really should be made in this chamber with all members who are elected, 87 of us, to, who represent our diverse communities, but instead this legislation uh, really has this extraordinary power to uh, let the cabinet make those decisions. So that of course is one egregious mistake. The second one is that this uh, legislation is too wide ranging. Uh, it confers powers to defy federal law when the UCP feels offended by the federal government. So they just define like a federal initiative uh, is a law, a program, a policy, an agreement, or action. And as I was saying, in the throne speech, they do list uh, federal programs such as um, provincial health care, child care, education, and I just spoke briefly about what does that mean for housing and sort of shared some ramifications uh, about that. And then the third... Uh, Yes, Honourable Member, go thank, ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, <coughs> I, I know that you do a lot of door knocking in your constituency and then in other constituencies across the province because you, you lend a hand in, in, in others as well. And particularly when it comes to affordable childcare, I was hoping that you could share uh, a little bit about that uh, regarding the door knocking that you've done and what you've heard from Albertans and how important that is. But just a reminder to all members on interventions, it's super excellent practice to speak through the chair at all times. The Honourable Member. Well, thank you. Uh, thanks for that reminder, um, Madam Speaker. And uh, absolutely, uh, child care is a key issue for families. We know it is uh, expensive, high quality child care. And we know that without that, uh, we don't have uh, full employment. A lot of times with women, because they um, tend to be the primary caregivers. Not always, but still largely women, more than men, uh, do stay home with kids. And, uh, you know, it becomes prohibitive uh, for them to actually go out and work, even if they want to, even if they're wanting to, uh, you know, get back within their profession or whatever work they did previous to having children, uh, feel that they can't uh, do that because it is so extraordinarily expensive. So the federal program that invested significant, significant uh, uh, funds uh, in a program uh, has been a real game changer for so many families. And, you know, I have three sons of my own. All of them are adults now. Um, but uh, certainly when I was a young mom and working and uh, a single mom at times, I, uh, 
I, I struggled. It was hard. It was like a mortgage payment. Sometimes it's been referred to as a mortgage payment. And I did my best to, you know, make ends meet at time. It still made sense for me to work uh, with, in terms of the uh, kind of uh, job I had, but it was very, uh, very difficult. So the federal government has really stepped up and uh, the affordable child care program is so key. And I know it's uh, a really important program. And will this be one of the initiatives that uh, the UCP will say, well, they're mucking around in our stuff and we want it this way or that way. So it's hard to know what this is. And uh, that's why it is um, too wide ranging. You know, that's sort of the second uh, critique of this legislation. And then a third one is that it's completely impractical. It's so broad in scope. Provincial entities that uh, the UCP could say, okay, you have to defy federal law, like one of those uh, federal initiatives. It could be a law, it could be a program, it could be a service. Um, but provincial entities, and this is a big, broad definition, include almost any body that receives provincial funding, including municipalities, school boards, universities, and police forces. And, you know, they could be ordered to defy federal laws. This certainly throws a lot of chaos into the Alberta um, community. And, uh, you know, frankly, uh, this bill really makes Alberta look ridiculous. It's kind of a bit of a la laughing stock. If you've seen any of the media in the last while, Alberta uh, is uh, really taking a step in a direction that others, uh, uh, constitutional scholars, are there others to join the debates on um, the reasoned amendment on Bill 1? The Honourable Member for Edmonton, West Hende. Thank you, Madam Speaker. It's a privilege to rise this evening to speak to uh, Bill 1, more specifically the amendment before us. Again, uh, just looking at it, that uh, this act be not now read a second time because the Assembly is of the view that the bill is negatively impacting investment decisions and the Alberta economy and should not proceed in order to protect the economic well-being of Albertans. Now, uh, we've heard uh, quite a, a fulsome discussion this evening, not nearly enough, I don't think, uh, Madam Speaker. I think that we still have some more conversations to have this evening and into the future, but uh, specifically on this uh, reasoned amendment and why it would be so important to move forward with it and not read this a second time uh, and not have this legislation proceed, and I think that uh, there are several arguments for that and a few that have been made. One, of course, the economic argument and the uncertainty that this legislation is uh, creating in the business environment uh, when it comes to investors being concerned about what the, the future of, of relations between the federal and provincial government look like and uh, what um, you know potentially arbitrary decisions that this provincial government uh, might be trying to make into the future, uh, whether, uh, you know, um, a variety of, of issues that might come up in the near future and unfortunately again uh, through uh, the discussions that this government has has um, or press conferences that this government and uh, the premier and this ministers have have come forward with unfortunately uh, there hasn't been much further clarity uh, since it was introduced uh, Again, a number of concerns. The uh, massive amount of power that this government is, is trying to give itself and this cabinet is trying to give itself. Um, you know, we, we saw this play out uh, in regards to Bill 10, uh, and there was a massive uproar uh, from, from a variety of different uh, uh, experts on the left, on the right, uh, academic, uh, cons or academics and constitutional experts. Uh, a variety of people came forward and, and shared their concerns about Bill 10 and the uh, additional powers that that was uh, going to authorize under the Alberta Public Health Act. And eventually, uh, the UCP came back and uh, the, the Premier at the time, uh, Jason Kenney, I believe I can use his name now, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Madam Speaker, but uh, Jason Kenney came forward after that legislation was in the past and said over the past year it has become clear that this power, the power uh, provided by Bill 10, is not necessary. I've always been uncomfortable with this idea of the executive part of government being able to modify legislation. That's the power that belongs exclusively with the elected representatives uh, of Albertans in the Legislative Assembly. 
And I am sure, Madam Speaker, that at the time of Bill 10 and the subsequent uh, caucus meetings that happened following that, that many members uh, in the government and that continue to be in the government raised concerns about the amount of power that this cabinet was giving themselves. Now, I'm sure that when we reflect back on Bill 1 and the time that has passed since then and the uh, massive amount of new people who have been added to Cabinet, that there's probably fewer uh, private members that are concerned about giving the Cabinet more power, since there is so many of them now. But I sure hope that there are still uh, at least a few private members, Madam Speaker, that are raising concerns about the power that this government is once again trying to give themselves and I hope that they might have, uh, with all the disagreements that I've had with the uh, prior uh, Premier, Jason Kenney, that they might feel uh, the clarity there and, and, and might vote against this legislation and support this reason amendment. We will uh, wait and see, Madam Speaker, of course. Uh, I'm not sure, uh, based on the amount of, um, you know, backtracking that a number of uh, leadership contestants at the time, now cabinet ministers, uh, the amount of backtracking that they've done. Of course, the um, now deputy premier took it uh, one step further and said, I'm, I'm sure there are safeguards in place, and this is in, in reference to the member from Lethbridge East, I believe, Madam Speaker, uh, saying that um, <laughs> that, that, that member uh, said, that deputy premier said that uh, I believe safeguards are in place to, you know, uh, ensure that this, this type of power isn't abused. Now I might be uh, getting my quote wrong, Madam Speaker, but uh, at that same time, the, the deputy premier said that uh, they hadn't actually read the legislation. And so, you know, these are the types of concerns that I have when uh, ministers are speaking on behalf of the Crown and on behalf of the government and saying, don't worry about this legislation, it doesn't do what it's saying you're going to do, but I actually haven't read it, but just take my word for it. I mean, that's very concerning, Madam Speaker. I think no matter who you are, uh, what side of the political spectrum you're from, that that should be uh, concerning. And so it was interesting that um, that member and the Deputy Premier had a moment of clarity there and, and decided to share that um, they had not actually read the legislation a few days at least after it had been introduced. Now again, uh, other leadership contestants that we've seen, the, the now Finance Minister uh, called this legislation a, a time bomb, the Jobs Minister uh, who was earlier today defending this legislation calling uh, Bill 1 a, a fairy tale at the time. And further, Municipal Affairs Minister, uh, another leadership contestant, calling uh, this legislation anarchy. And, and the list goes on and on. But unfortunately, uh, since that leadership contest, as we've seen and, and heard, um, all of these members have chosen uh, to, not, to not follow through with their convictions and instead uh, have, have stepped aside to let uh, the Premier uh, draft this legislation and put it forward. And uh, I would refer back to uh, an article from, from Global News from December 5th, Madam Speaker, uh, which happens to be today, um, where the Premier stated that you never get things right 100%. Uh, let me try that again. You never get things right 100% right all the time. They might have misquoted, but you never get things right 100% of the time uh, is what the Premier stated uh, to Global News. And unfortunately, when we're talking about the flagship bill of a government, for them to bring it forward uh, and not have it right is, is incredibly unfortunate, to say the least, Madam Speaker. Uh, it reminds me of another saying in the uh, construction industry. It's been a few years since I was there. But, uh, you know, measure twice, cut once. Uh, of course, um, the consequences of cutting a two by four too short or too long in the construction industry uh, not necessarily as consequential as uh, fundamentally altering the ability of um, cabinet and uh, fundamentally altering democracy in the province, of course. And so, again, going back to the idea of uncertainty and the changes that are being proposed in this legislation and the uh, concerns that the business community and investors are bringing forward. Um, I, I had raised through an intervention, Madam Speaker, um, 
Well, a member opposite brought forward the idea through an intervention uh, regarding Section 2 that nothing in this Act is to be construed as, and they were specifically looking at uh, 2C there. But this entire section, nothing in this Act is construed to be, uh, or is to be construed as uh, A, 2A, authorizing any order that would be contrary to the Constitution of Canada. I mean, this is absolutely ridiculous, Madam Speaker. If if we had the ability to just write it into legislation for it be, to become true, then why wouldn't we just put this in everything? Just because you say that your act is uh, not against the Constitution or not unconstitutional doesn't uh, make it so. Uh, and further, to create more confusion for investors and, uh, again, businesses that are w looking to work within a, a province or a jurisdiction that uh, is able to follow the, the rule of law and the rule of the land. Uh, on, on page 7, looking under section 8, no cause of action, no cause of action lies against and no action or proceeding may be commenced against. Uh, further into A there, uh, in respect of any act or thing done or omitted to be done under or in relation to this act or resolution or order under this act, including without limitation any failure to do something when that person has discretionary authority to do something but does not do it or, and it goes on. So again, a piece of legislation that's saying uh, nothing in this act is, is unconstitutional, but further in saying if somebody acts and it is potentially to be considered unconstitutional, that uh, no course of action should be uh, taken against them. And I think I see a, an intervention here, which I will take. Thank you. Well, thanks, um, uh, Honourable Member. I appreciate uh, your analysis um, thus far. And you know, further to where you were just talking about, um, I, I, again, where one part of the bill seems to affirm or try to reassure people that, oh, we wouldn't do something like that, then, in fact, the other, another part of the bill, in fact, enables a cabinet to make arbitrary decisions without bringing uh, um, laws or bills or alterations to, uh, to for, for debate in the legislature. And so, you know, the perhaps the best illustration of that duplicity that I've seen in the last 72 hours. This is all unfolding very quickly. It's like watching a car crash in slow motion, right? And um, is um, <clears throat> where I heard um, the uh, Premier say that, oh, you know, I would, we would maybe ever never even use this legislation, right? Remember that, um, uh, Madam Speaker, right? Where he said, oh, well, we probably, you know, hopefully, you know, God forbid we would never have to use this legislation. And yet, she instructed all of her cabinet ministers to find places to use Sorry, the same phone. Sorry, member. <clears throat> Please proceed. <clears throat> well, thank you, Madam, Madam Speaker, and uh, I do appreciate that interjection. And indeed, um, this government seems to be, and this premier seems to be saying one thing, and then, uh, you know, sometimes from day to day, hour to hour, instructing ministers uh, and her cabinet to, to do something different. And so, again, just looking at the section and, and no cause of action, that is uh, concerning in of itself, um, asking uh, potentially uh, as described in the definitions of this legislation and as uh, sort of laid out through the legislation, uh, potentially asking school boards or municipal governments or uh, anyone affected by the Education Act or Post-Secondary Learning Act, asking them to make uh, decisions that are potentially contrary to uh, federal law uh, and, and then uh, telling them that, well, I mean, again, the legislation lays out, which in and of itself seems like, uh, well, I'm not sure if it's constitu constitutional itself, but saying that they can't be held accountable, nor can the ministers be held accountable for the decisions that they're making that might be in contravention of federal law. I mean, Madam Speaker, if it wasn't so dangerous and, um, and so... Uh, concerning to the business community in terms of the uncertainty that it raises uh, between the relationship between not only the federal government and of course uh, um, uh, our, our municipal governments and our school boards, duly elected representatives uh, on several different levels across the province that might be caught in a constitutional battle because the provincial government is upset about a certain decision or a funding agreement that may or may not have been put forward. I see another intervention, Madam Speaker, so I will take that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Honourable Member. I'm, I'm curious to know the member's thoughts on if other provinces across the country decided to introduce a similar act how would Alberta, who's a landlocked province, get our resources to Tidewater? 
I'm a big proponent of LNG. I think there's a significant opportunity for Alberta to export LNG um, globally. I think there's a huge need uh, that's been exacerbated by Russia's invasion of Ukraine and a need for ethically sourced energy. So Alberta is bringing in a sovereignty act <clears throat> because Alberta doesn't want to use the mechanisms that are already in place to dispute any kind of federal overreach. Um, so I'm curious to hear, Madam Speaker, the members' thoughts on what would happen to the future of Alberta if every province um, brought in their own sovereignty act where they could effectively uh, unilaterally halt a project that would be in the best interests of the whole country. Well, thank you, uh, Madam Speaker, and thank you for that introduction as well. And, of course, that would be very concerning, and I think that many members have brought forward that if, if it was the NDP in government bringing forward this legislation, talking about, you know, uh, giving extreme power to Cabinet and, um, I mean... <laughs> I thought there was libertarians, I think the member from Edmonton Manning uh, brought this issue or this point forward, but I thought there was libertarians left in the Conservative caucus, but their silence on this issue um, proves otherwise, or, or the fact that they, you know, have been promoted to uh, the front bench and now have become silent, so many of them. But specific to that issue, Madam Speaker, I, I think it's important, again, further in the legislation, looking at judicial review. I mean, um, if, if the province uh, makes a decision and... Um, you know, somebody wants to bring forward a, a judicial review, which of course is, is their right. Again, looking at Bill 1, reducing the normal period of, of seeking that review from six months to 30 days. And so somebody concerned about constitutionality of something, whether it be uh, a, a funding agreement that potentially the provincial government has, has backed out of because they're upset with the, the federal government or... Uh, uh, policy regarding energy or agriculture or uh, emissions, whatever it might be, that somebody is concerned about uh, the constitutionality of it is now also from this government in Bill 1 having uh, their period to uh, gather all of their legal documents and put forward their legal team uh, going from six months to 30 days. Again, these are changes that... <laughs> do not uh, support the idea of strengthening the rule of law. If anything, they are attacking it. And again and again, stakeholders uh, from all sides of the political spectrum uh, have said that this, at the end of the day, is going to hurt uh, economic opportunities within our province. I know that... Uh, and, and Madam Speaker, I, I just do want to take one more moment to... Uh, again, recognize that we are on a reason amendment, uh, that this legislation not now be read a second time because the assemblies of the b bill uh, the view that the bill is negatively impacting investment. So uh, I am supporting this motion. And how much time do I have, Madam Speaker, if you don't Just mind? over a minute. Uh, just over a minute. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, you know, there is many issues, there are many issues that are going to uh, arise in the near future. Uh, one of them that this uh, Premier has uh, sort of mused over is, is changes to uh, health care premiums, changes to, you know, uh, very small um, health spending accounts, which would not even cover, uh, in many cases, uh, you know, general practitioner or, or physician uh, visits. And so there are many Albertans concerned about that. And another large concern when we talk about stability in a province is making sure that we are uh, staying uh, within the, the legislative uh, framework of things like the Canada Health Act. And so I think that there is a lot more considerations to be made around how this legislation could affect um, some potential battle in the future. Of course, Madam Speaker, that's hypothetical. Um, but with this Premier and this legislation, we're just left completely unsure. And again, we look at the instability uh, that this legislation has created and the uncertainty that through several press conferences and through uh, discussions in the legislature. Thank you. There are members wishing to speak to Amendment R. A. 1, the Honourable Member for Drayton Valley, Devon. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I want to start by commenting tonight on, on what a reasoned amendment is supposed to be. The reasoned amendment is a, is a course of action that the uh, legislature can take that 
asks for the legislature to uh, consider a bill that's under uh, consideration in the House. And it's used to try and, and stop the progress of a bill because they will argue, they will reason, that it's uh, a bill that is, is, is outside of the scope, or their arguments are that, that they must use arguments that, that uh, say that the bill is, uh, what is the bill about, what is it supposed to be about? They're supposed to deal with the bill, what is it about, what is it trying to do, and that uh, the reasoned amendment, the reasons that they use must stay within the scope of that bill. They must address exactly what that bill is doing and, and why they would have reasons for not moving forward with that bill based on what is within the bill. And then they must come up forward and they must be able to show that, that their reasons um, are, are fatal to the bill. That in, in other words, it can't just raise a series of objections that could be uh, um, dealt with by submitting amendments at the committee stage or in the reporting stage, but that their reasons point out that there are so many serious flaws in the bill that, that it, it just shouldn't go forward. So it must be more than simply a, a direct negation of the, uh, of the whole principle of the bill. If the reasoned amendment is agreed to, the bill uh, can't make any more progress, and so we're really talking about a, uh, reasons that show that there's serious, serious flaws within the bill. And as I've been listening tonight, I, uh, I, I just don't hear that coming from the opposition. They're not making the case. Bill number one, the primary purpose of this bill is to enforce the Canadian Constitution's division of powers. That's its primary purpose. To ensure that the Canadian, that the federal actions that the federal laws passed by the federal government do not encroach on provincial constitutional rights. And it shifts the burden, Bill number one, Bill one, the uh, Alberta Sovereignty within the United Candidate Act, shifts the burden to the federal government to legally challenge Alberta's refusal to enforce unconstitutional or harmful federal, federal legislation. So if the federal government is passing unconstitutional legislation that we would then, through a motion in the House, would refuse to enforce that unconstitutional law. Now, I've heard a lot of arguments and reasons uh, provided by the opposition tonight and earlier for why we shouldn't proceed with this bill. They talk about it being dictatorial, they talk about it being undemocratic, they talk about it being unconstitutional, they talk about uh, a whole series of, of uh, uh, reasons that sometimes they give, but I'm not sure that there's any real um, evidence to support their allegations. If we take a look at uh, one of the arguments that I, I heard uh, from the uh, leader of the official opposition was that um, the cure is worse than the illness. We're creating massive economic instability with this. Well, let's be clear. The thing that is creating massive economic instability, as we've seen through Bill C-69, which has scared out billions and billions of dollars out of this province, which has created an uh, uh, economic situation where uh, many of the businesses in my constituency that are involved in oil and gas have gone under in the last three or four years because we're, we're locked, our, our access to uh, tidewater is, is not there because of Bill C-69 and Bill C-48. We can't seem to get our resources out of this province. That's what's created the massive economic instability. And Bill 1 is our response to those unconstitutional laws. And we know that the Alberta courts have ruled that Bill C-69 is indeed unconstitutional. So if you were going to move forward with the reasoned amendment, 
And your reason is that it's unconstitutional or that it creates, uh, in this case, with this argument, uh, it's creating in, in intense economic pressure. No, I'm going to finish my points, thank you. Um, intense economic pressure on the economy? Well, it's just not there. The original passage of an unconstitutional law which interferes with Alberta's rights to be able to harvest, to own and harvest our natural resources and to send them to markets so that we can produce wealth and generate wealth in this province. It's, it's that unconstitutional federal law that's creating the economic disturbance within this province. I've been doing some reading about whether it's unconstitutional. Here's some quotes that I'd like to read. This one comes from Eric Adams from the University of Alberta. No province has ever tested whether the constitutional authority exists for a legislature to order entities within the province, which would include police forces, cities and towns, provincial public agencies, not to comply with federal laws. Did you hear what it said? And this is a, a, a professor at the University of Alberta. No province has ever tested whether the constitutional authority exists for a legislature to order entities within the province, which would include police forces, cities, and towns, and provincial public agencies not to comply with the federal laws. Hmm. Hasn't been tested yet. I would suggest that Bill 1 is just a, a very creative way of trying to defend and create a shield for Albertans to be able to use to protect our economy and to protect us from a government, a federal government, that is often overreached in the passage of its federal laws. He continues, Adams suggested there would be a stronger argument for a province to refuse to enforce unconstitutional federal legislation. There are times when a provincial or municipal jurisdiction have set priorities, ignored federal or existing laws. For example, in the 1970s, Quebec stopped prosecuting Henry Morgenthaler for what was at the time performing illegal abortions. And the Vancouver Police Force has also said at times it would stop char uh, charging for possession of marijuana. Hmm. It would appear that uh, we have a situation where the reasoned amendment is that they should stop the bill because it's unconstitutional, and yet here is a professor from the University of Alberta which is saying, oh, it's not particularly unconstitutional. Uh, lots of provinces have chosen to uh, cooperate with the federal government or not cooperate with the federal government and either enforce or not enforce federal legislation. Here's another one. Jeffrey Sigalet, University of BC. He's the director of UBC's Center for Constitutional Law and Legal Studies. In its meat, that is, in the meat of Bill 1, it doesn't empower any provincial officials to disobey jurisdiction, or judicial decisions. Instead, it enables the province, via these motions, to set conditions or not to cooperate with the federal government in relation to cer certain federal law the province deems unconstitutional, Siglet said. And that's totally constitutional. So if the argument for this reasoned amendment is that we've got a bill here that isn't constitutional, well, here's the head or the director of UBC's Center for Constitutional Law and Legal Studies, which is saying, oh, guess what? Hmm. And that's totally constitutional. The province didn't say that they're the final arbiter. They didn't say that the courts have nothing over this. They didn't say you can disobey a judge. It's not saying we're not going to listen to you uh, courts and we're not going to listen to the federal government, he said. It's saying the federal government has its jurisdiction and we have ours. That sounds pretty constitutional. And so the reasoned amendment I would suggest, doesn't have a leg to stand on here. Tristan Hopper from the National Post on December the 5th, maybe a little later. Provinces aren't allowed to break federal law, but they've always been able to pick and choose which parts if they feel like taking seriously. The province can decide to nullify a new enactment simply by refusing to prosecute cases brought under the law this law, 
Alan Young, an associate professor at Osgoode Hall Law School. And he says again, after the Trudeau government announced a series of 11th hour amendments that would effectively criminalize most types of semi-automatic rifles, Saskatchewan Firearms Act, a bill asserting jurisdiction over firearms enforcement. Hmm. Seems like there's other provinces out there that are trying to set up shields that would protect them from overreach by the federal government. And it's not deemed unconstitutional. Madam Speaker, if you're going to go and argue for a reasoned amendment, and if that reasoned amendment has to stay within the scope of the bill, and it has to show that the reasons for not going forward uh, show that the bill is fatally flawed, in other words, that it can't just raise a series of objections that could be dealt with by submitting amendments at the committee stage, then my argument would be that this bill needs to be rejected by this House as a reasoned amendment. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The uh, Honourable Member for Edmonton, Castle Downs. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, it's my pleasure to rise this evening to speak to the reasoned amendment RA1 uh, that was introduced by the Honourable Member from uh, Edmonton, Beverly Clearview. And it says, to move that the motion for second reading of Bill 1, Alberta Sovereignty Within a United Canada Act, be amended by deleting all of the words after that and substituting the following. Bill 1, Alberta Sovereignty Within a United Canada Act, be not now read a second time because the Assembly is of the view that the bill is negatively impacting investment decisions and the Alberta economy and should not proceed in order to protect the economic well-being of Albertans. Um, while we got a rather um, interesting definition of what a reasoned amendment is, I find it baffling that members of the government can stand up and deny that this bill is com completely creating chaos within industry within our in economic investors. Um, we've heard from so many across the province and across the nation about the concerns with this piece of legislation. Um, while the leadership review was going on, we had members of this now current cabinet that spoke quite openly uh, about their concerns and the devastation and the impact um, that this would negatively have on Alberta's economy. Yet, here we are in the chamber speaking to Bill 1 and there's been nothing that has created a sense of stability, a sense of confidence um, that would explain why we should proceed with this piece of legislation. I am in full support of this reasoned amendment and I do believe that we should stop this piece of legislation from going forward and send a clear and direct message to future investors that it's not going forward. There is an opportunity to, to regain some sort of stability in the province. We're hearing loud and clear that we are losing investment opportunities. We're hearing concerns. Uh, absolutely, go ahead, please. <clears throat> Thanks, um, member from um, Castle Downs. I appreciate your uh, perspective. And um, what I'm curious, and I just want to bring it back to, of course, the amendment and the scope of the amendment, and it's to, to protect the economic well-being of Albertans, Albertans, and negatively impacting investment decisions and the Alberta economy. And so I, I know you've been following um, the uh, culture ministry closely over this last number of years, and um, there's a number of areas within the culture ministry that um, have a significant contribution to our economy, right? Uh, Madam Speaker, we have, for example, the, the uh, film and television industry, which is um, a burgeoning industry. It's growing um, quite quickly. But um, <clears throat> I know um, from experience as culture minister that it can move and it can go, go to one place and then leave very quickly, right? If there's circumstances change in the t film and television industry, they can just simply pack up and leave. <clears throat> uh, 
Uh, thank you to the honourable member for, for that um, contribution. I, I wholeheartedly agree that there's so many potential projects that are at risk because of this piece of legislation. Um, there's so many investment that comes from film and television from outside of the province that employs directly individuals from the province. We have crews, we have uh, lighting, we have costume. There are so many things that happen once a big production decides to come to Alberta. When this piece of legislation is signaling to investors that there's chaos, uncertainty, and it's not stable, it creates a space where investors simply might not want to come here. When they can go next door to a province that has uh, no Sovereignty Act before its legislature, um, they're not going to sit around and wait to see what if, what happens. The very fact that this piece of legislation was introduced despite outcry from Albertans, from business leaders, from industries, saying that this mere introduction of the legislation of the Alberta Sovereignty Act it needs to stop. We know that international investors that saw the, the introduction of this bill, Bill 1, it signaled that Alberta has simply a different set of rules than the rest of Canada. And there's no amount of tweaking, if you will, that could happen that will change that perspective perception. Um, regardless of how you change it or add to it or remove it like some of the members would like you to believe, um, when asked about their, their flip of stance from being vehemently opposed to it prior to the leadership review to now being in cabinet and, and agreeing with it, you know, we heard things like, well, there's things that are different. Some of the stuff is different. Well, things and stuff uh, is not very reassuring language, but the language that this bill has has already signaled significant concern to investors. And the only way, Madam Speaker, that you're going to instill investor confidence is to kill this bill. It's to support this amendment and let it die. We can't continue to live in a province with so much chaos and so much stability in so many areas caused by this government to now pile on to that with the introduction of the Alberta Sovereignty within the United Canada Act. I am just baffled by why this government isn't listening to some of the, the, the business leaders, the industry leaders, economic leaders, telling them that it's going to destroy jobs chase away investment, and stifle our Alberta's economy. People are struggling in this province with their everyday lives. Cost of groceries has gone up. Insurance rates, tuition. People are accessing the food bank at record numbers, Madam Speaker. And the very first piece of legislation that this government introduces completely creates more chaos, more instability to investors when we're trying to draw investment into this province. It's hard to argue that a company should come here and invest here when there's this type of chaos happening. The result is going to be that people are not only going to come and invest here, but people are going to leave. We've seen it in, in healthcare. We saw what happened when this government interfered with doctors and nurses during a health crisis. It continues, Madam Speaker. We, we've heard from so many healthcare professionals across the province tell us that they were leaving. They didn't feel supported. They didn't feel um, like this government was making decisions that were in the best interest of Albertans. And here we are again with Bill 1 talking about legislation that is scaring investors, that is creating instability. 
Uh, yes, I'll give way to the to the member. Uh, thank you, honourable member. I just wanted to, you know, we're we're talking about not having this bill read at first, or a, having this bill be read. Uh, I'm just curious if you could maybe talk about some of the important things about why this shouldn't be Bill One. Um, I know you're connected with the Children's Dollary, and maybe your experience in working with some of the families there that have had children in emergency and things like that. Is that some of the things that maybe you're hearing about happening within Calgary and Edmonton? And maybe that should be the priority right now versus the Sovereignty Act. And when you have direct frontline experience, you know how devastating some of the changes that this government has made, um, the impact that it's had. And she made reference to um, a personal connection to the Stollery. So I, I have a, f a few. Um, my son, my youngest, when he was born, he lived at the Stollery. Uh, I lived there with him. Um, he was a very, very sick baby. And through the immediate reaction of our pediatrician at the time, uh, we were able to have him admitted, and they were able to find a place for me to be able to stay with him. Now, that was almost 19 years ago. My baby will be 19 on December 12th. And so when I look at the state of what the Stollery was then, and the care that, that we received as a family compared to the heartbreaking stories that are happening, not just at the Children's Stollery, but at the Calgary um, Children's Hospital. I can't imagine what the parents are going through right now, Madam Speaker. And to have this absolute crisis in children's health care is absolutely <coughs> unacceptable. And for the very first piece of legislation that this government introduces um, in, amongst this crisis is this Sovereignty Act, is so out of touch. It is creating more and more chaos and stress. And I can tell you that those parents that are sitting perhaps in a trailer waiting 15, 20 hours for their child to see a, a, an emergency doctor, they are outraged absolutely outraged with the complete disregard from this government. We are hearing absolutely devastating stories on this side of the House. And I know that members of government are also hearing these stories. You can't understand what's going on and support this as Bill 1. It, it just, it makes absolutely no sense while there is so much chaos and crisis happening in the province for so many Albertans. Why creating Bill 1 as a piece of legislation that contributes so much to that instability and crisis. It needs to stop. It needs to, to not move forward. And people of this legislature need to support Bill 1 and vote yes for our amendment. We, we can't, in good conscience, know what's happening in the province with our children that are requiring emergency health care and proceed on this piece of legislation. Our government, um, our uh, opposition, made two attempts in this very chamber to discuss the crisis because we knew it wasn't going to be addressed in their first bill, that this is clearly not a government priority. So we brought forward two attempts to discuss children's medical in this chamber. Both of them were voted down. We know that there's kids that are sick all across the province. We know that schools are suffering with lack of attendance because of illness Teachers are stressed out, they're burnt out, they're asking for support. The solution was for staff to be pulled from the Rotary Flames House in an attempt to meet the rising unmet patient needs at the Alberta Children's Hospital. So
So for those that don't know what the Rotary Flames House does, they provide children and families um, with respite care. So these are kids that are really, really sick. And instead of talking about alternative solutions to how we can support the absolutely harmful wait times of children in this province, this government chose not to debate it, didn't see it as a priority, and instead we're debating Bill 1. So for a health care system that's been broken by this government, and a government that's doing nothing to repair it. We're here talking about a piece of legislation that creates so much chaos for our economy. It just simply does not make sense, Madam Speaker, why when we've heard from leaders across the province saying that this is absolutely not a piece of legislation that should go forward, it gives way too much power to the UCP. It's going to create too much stress and discomfort and um, harmful intentions to those that are in possibly looking at coming to Alberta to invest. Why would this government continue to, to want to put this forward and risk that? I just, I, I don't understand. They, they talk about, you know, the NDP standing up and, and creating chaos. Well... A lot of this isn't our words, Madam Speaker. If you turn on the national news, people are talking about the chaos in Alberta. Why? Because of the introduction of this legislation. The majority of Albertans do not support this legislation. Yet here we are debating a bill that this Premier is insisting go ahead despite not understanding it when it was introduced and saying that we were inaccurate and then changing some of her language to say, oh, no, we didn't intend that, it's too late. The damage is already done. This bill was introduced. Investors are worried. That is not the type of Alberta that we want to draw attraction to. We want people to look to our province and be able to see a stable government. We want them to be able to see that legislation that's going forward is truly in the best interest of Albertans. This government is so out of touch when it comes to what is truly important to Albertans. Thank you. There are others to speak to the reasoned amendment on Bill 1, the Honourable Member for Edmonton North West. <clears throat> Well, thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to uh, say a few words in regards to this um, recent uh, amendment, um, which um, says, in essence, that uh, the uh, United uh, Alberta sovereignty within the United Canada Act not be read a second time um, because of the negative in Im uh, impacts on investment decisions and the Alberta economy, not proceed in order to protect the Alberta economic well-being. So. Um, as um, I listened with interest to the uh, member from Drain Valley talking about constitution, I mean, I think that there are constitutional problems with this uh, uh, Alberta Sovereignty Act, uh, but this particular reasoned amendment is talking about economic impacts specifically. And so um, I've asked uh, a number of speakers during this evening about their own um, ministerial or critic areas that um, they are responsible for to speculate on how um, this Alberta Sovereignty Act might have a negative impact on that particular part of the Alberta economy. And um, the area that I um, know something about, um, Madam Speaker, is in regards to post-secondary education. And our 26 colleges, universities, polytechnics um, spread across the province are a, um, <clears throat> an incredible asset that um, will help us to build um, the economy for now and for the future, to help to build citizens and to build a quality of life for now and the future here in the province of Alberta. 
And those post-secondaries are almost entirely a joint venture between the provincial government and the federal government. And the federal government makes quite a lot of investments and a lot of decisions around post-secondaries um, here in the province and right across the country as well. And indeed, the investment is essential for particularly research in our post-secondaries here in the province of Alberta. And Madam Speaker, that research work, um, as diverse as it might be, and um, you know, through various uh, academic pursuits and uh, scientific and technological pursuits, has real dramatic and um, demonstrable, I should say, um, effects on our economy here in the province of Alberta. And so anytime you are compromising that by somehow suggesting that you will put a bill or a law in between the normal course of choices that post-secondaries and academics will make in regards to um, uh, research and development in a particular institution, um, or somehow um, directing or redirecting through law the partnerships that exist between provincial and, and federal government in post-secondary institutions, that's a real impact on potentially the economy of our province. And this is a long-standing way by which um, our colleges, universities, and polytechnics have been founded over many decades, right? Really since the beginning of Confederation. And to somehow interfere with that process with a false sense of, um, of sovereignty act, I think is a real problem. And I will certainly give way um, to the Honourable Member for Edmonton Ellerslie. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker, and <clears throat> thank you to the member uh, for allowing me to uh, provide a little bit of an intervention. And of course, uh, when I got up to speak uh, uh, on this recent amendment, I was uh, giving the House a bit of a warning uh, and I think that this is a, another example of a very important warning in terms of the implications that this particular bill not only will have on the immediate economy, and, uh, but now we're seeing that it, will, it could potentially impact our post-secondary institutions. And when you're talking about post-secondary institutions and impacts of legislation that they'll have, these impacts are going to go on from generation to generation down the road. And uh, I'm hoping that, uh, member, you wouldn't mind speaking to what could potentially be some of those implications that perhaps members on the other side of the House aren't really thinking about at this moment when it comes to actually introducing the, this Sovereignty Act. Yeah, no, thanks, um, honorable member from Edmonton Ellerslie. And indeed, you know, it doesn't have to be a generational change. And in fact, things can move quite quickly, right? Because uh, when people make choices around investment, really um, grants and, and, and choices that are made around post-secondary, it's, it's, it's an investment too. Sometimes tens or even hundreds of millions of dollars. You look at the nanotechnology um, uh, uh, that the federal government has put into uh, the University of Alberta here, for example. I mean, that has tangible long-term consequences um, in a positive way, but by compromising the integrity of the relationship between the federal government and the provincial government, it can have a pretty fast effect on students choosing to study here in the province of Alberta. If they feel like there's some element of instability, um, I see students all of the time in my life, my own professional life, my own personal life. Um, you know, they're pretty mobile, right? They can move from one place to another or to choose a, an acceptance to a, a you know, to a, a department or studying for a degree, post-secondary degree, um, all around, all over the world at this point in time. And, uh, you know, we, we um, uh, respect that choice, but we want them to have a top quality, world-class choice right here in the province of Alberta, if they want to do that. And so while it takes generations, perhaps it takes generations or a long time to build up the re reputation of a post-secondary institution, 
you can lose that in a matter of months even if something like the Sovereignty Act, you know, rears its ugly head and, you know, you find that people um, are, are having a second guess about Alberta and Alberta's uh, commitment to the uh, provincial federal uh, relationship that has helped to build uh, what, a, what a wonderful place that we have to live here today and wonderful post-secondary institutions that we have to study in here today as well. So those are the kinds of things you got to think about, you know, and, um, you know, it's not just what the individual content of this particular Sovereignty Act is, but the very idea of having a bill around sovereignty as well. That really has an, an, uh, an actual effect. And as I said briefly in uh, comments, interventions here earlier this evening, you know, I know that there's substantive differences between sovereignty legislation that uh, was enacted in the province of Quebec, right, um, from 1976 onwards and to, uh, you know, even from time to time to this present day uh, under different circumstances, right, um, than Alberta. But just the idea of the sovereignty, uh, uh, sovereignty legislation period, you know, is enough for people to vote with their feet, you know. And once one thing moves, then other things start to move too, right? Let's say, you know, again, this is an example from Quebec, right? Uh, that Sun, Sun Life decided to uh, close their headquarters in uh, the city of Montreal in, uh, you know, 40 years, 40 some years ago. Um, people took that as a signal, and then suddenly you saw other institutions, financial institutions, or railways, and, uh, and then people started to move on, on real estate as well because they thought, you know, it's like a, it, it, it's like one thing moves and then everything starts to move, right? Like what I said before, like when a glacier melts. And so, you know, we have an opportunity to nip it in the bud here, but we also have to recognize the gravity of the situation when you bring up the concept of a sovereignty act. Whether people see for what is in it substantively or whether they see a trend or a movement and a direction. And I can say, I think, in my judgment and in the judgment of investors and in uh, uh, researchers in post-secondary institutions, uh, in uh, real estate investments, in uh, technology investment in the oil and gas industry, you know, I think it's demonstrably and almost universally viewed as a negative choice, right? So let's nip it in the bud here now. I think it's not such a bad thing to do, right, to recognize when you need to change direction. Um, I know it's awkward because, of course, this was the flagship bill of a new um, uh, premier and government and so forth. But, you know, I think when you look at not just the nuts and the bolts, but the overall concept and direction, I think there's lots of better ways in which we can move at this juncture in the history of our province. We have unprecedented inflation, right? This is a 40-year high for... Uh, a lack of affordability that uh, reaches right through each sector of our society. Uh, you know, I mean, we are at MLA's and we uh, make good money, but you can see the difference, I'm sure, in the last few months that uh, everything is much more expensive. And just imagine someone who is, um, you know, earning a third or a quarter of a fifth of the salary that uh, you might have. And just imagine how difficult that is. Imagine having um, a young child in uh, grade school right now with um, a really an unprecedented uh, flu season just getting started and already literally flooding our hospitals and our emergency rooms and our capacity to deal with um, uh, severe flu uh, symptoms, right? Again, just two examples of th something that's literally happening by the minute in real time all around us that we need to deal with using this legislative power and the power of the government of Alberta to uh, mitigate the affordability crisis in this province, to look for ways to um, uh, build capacity in our public health system in order to reassure public confidence in this government to be able to deal with issues like that. Does it instill confidence in a government when you are faced with two obvious crises right in front of your eyes, and then you choose to have this as your first bill? I think not. I would, I would give away to Thank you uh, for the opportunity <coughs> to intervene. I'm very interested in, in uh, your perspective on uh, you know, what is important versus what is not important in terms of uh, the government's time. I know that you are one of the uh, longest uh, serving 
MLAs in this house at the present time, and uh, you certainly would have some perspective on, uh, you know, what happens when a government just totally ignores the important issues of the day, and and uh, um, and focuses on things that, that are important to them, and how that, you know, affects uh, the the belief of the people of Alberta that their government serves them well. And what's the long-term consequence of having a government that doesn't listen to its own people? And, and, uh, and, and how does that cast um, all of us who serve in this legislature in a negative light? I'd certainly love to hear uh, your thoughts about the, the sort of the implications of, uh, of acting in this way where you ignore serious issues for non-serious ones. <clears throat> well, thanks. Um Honourable Member from uh, Edmonton Rutherford, and uh, yeah, I mean, it, it might seem contradictory then why we would be dwelling on Bill One when, of course, we're probably bringing up these issues that are, you know, it's like a house on fire, right? And why would you be, you know, dwelling on Bill One? Let's just move past it. But you know, you have to deal with what's before you, and you know, hopefully, we can. Um, recalibrate what is most important here, you know, this evening um, to, to, to move back to where, uh, what Albertans are really concerned about, right? And um, certainly I know everyone is out reaching to their constituents and to Albertans around the province. I've certainly been doing that as well in the last few months. And, um, you know, I, I don't have to, it's self-evidence what the concerns are for people um, in regards to health care, in regards to affordability, um, which extends to education and so forth. And, you know, when you see something that might interfere with the um, uh, uh, timely um, um, action on those important issues, like, you know, debating the um, Sovereignty Act within the United Canada Act, right, um, at this moment, then you have to deal with that too, right, and so that you can move past and find what's really most important and what gives a, a best value back to Albertans and Alberta society as well. And so, um, you know, I, I appreciate this amendment. Um, I think that um, talking about the economic impacts is, um, is self-evident. And um, I've, I've seen lots of uh, people with a very quick analysis, but uh, a very decisive analysis that, yeah, it can literally shake markets when you start talking about sovereignty, right? And it doesn't matter. You say, oh, well, it's sovereignty within a happy, stable Canadian environment and everything's going to be okay. And they'll say, well, why are they making excuses so fast right in the title of the bill? You know, obviously something seems fishy, right? And, um, you know, when you have investments, uh, as it's not just you know, investment capital, um, but um, also, as I said, investment in uh, research and technology and human investment, right? People making choices to whether they would, let's say, move to a research facility and contribute to uh, technology and medical technology or whatever it is they're doing. Uh, and then should they move to um, Alberta or should they move that to another place that might uh, provide more stability and long-term certainty around uh, being able to work together with provincial funding and, uh, and uh, Canadian uh, and federal funding as well, right? I mean, all of those things work together, right? We live in a very sophisticated society that uh, we should all be proud of, and we should invest in those strengths every step of the way, right? And the fundamental strength, Madam Speaker, is that you know, when we work together in the broadest possible way, we work within confederation, and we work, of course, you know, there's things, issues that um, the uh, federal government does uh, that uh, we have to push back against, right? I'm no fan of the liberals, Lord knows, <laughs> and uh, certainly uh, have my uh, concerns about, uh, you know, uh, federal intrusion, but uh, there's ways by which you can deal with those without bringing up sovereignty, you know, either um, as a concept or quite specifically and using it especially as a threat. I mean, that's an antagonistic uh, approach that bears no uh, uh, productive fruit. And um, honestly, what we need to do at this juncture in our history is to start to deal with making life more affordable for Albertans, making um, uh, health care, uh, public health care there when you need it for yourself and your family to provide the safety and the security um, that um, 
those two things allow, affordability and um, a safe uh, place with uh, good health care to uh, raise a family, to put down roots, and long-term stability to know that there's stable government here to deliver f for all of those things and other issues as they come forward. So that, as Alberta New Democrats, would, is what we seek to, uh, to do, to provide stability, to provide a stable government. And um, this Alberta F uh, Sovereignty Act simply does not fit into that model. And thus, um, we would uh, um, suggest for all Albertans um, and uh, this House to uh, vote for this amendment, which would um, refer this uh, bill to not be read at this time. Thanks a lot. Are there others to join the debate on Amendment RA1 on Bill 1? The Honourable Member for Calgary, Abular McCall. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, I will be speaking in favour of this amendment that essentially is asking that this bill not be read a second time because uh, this bill will negatively impact investment decisions in the Alberta economy and should not proceed to protect the economic well-being of Albertans. There are a uh, few things that I will touch on. First and foremost, uh, Albertans, majority of Albertans, do not support this piece of legislation. It's not a priority for them because there are many other issues that are front and center for them. First, the cost of living uh, across this province has gone up because of inflation and UCP the UCP policies, Alberta want them to address that. The second thing is that Alberta's health care is in crisis. And in Calgary, the government solution is to put trailers outside Children's Hospital to provide care. That's where our health system stands right now. And this government is pushing ahead with this piece of legislation that will not help us with cost of living crisis, that will not fix a thing in our health system, and that will result in economic uncertainty and job loss across this province. This bill is giving Premier and Cabinet unprecedented powers to modify the application of laws to suspend the application of provincial laws as they see fit, and not just that, <gasps> rewrite those laws behind closed doors. And that power to amend by regulation a statute passed by legislature, commonly referred to as Henry the Eighth Clause. When we pointed that out, the government key message was that we are fear mongering. We didn't read the bill. And it turned out that when they read the bill, they found that clause there. And now they are trying to work around that. We haven't seen anything yet, but that's what they are saying. Second thing is, when we talk about uncertainty it creates, we are telling this government that business community 
has concern about this piece of legislation. They are reaching out to us. They are speaking out publicly as well. For instance, Calgary Chamber of Commerce. Calgary Chamber of Commerce CEO said, and I quote, there is no shred of evidence that this act will lead to economic growth. You can't tell me this is going to support economic growth and support continued economic diversification in this province, end quote. And she is 100% right about it because as the leader of official opposition mentioned earlier, that this bill is designed to stoke anger and it does nothing to help Albertans. And that's why majority of Albertans don't believe that this bill will do anything to resolve the grievances they have against Ottawa. Second thing, that not just Calgary Chamber of Commerce, we have also heard concerns from Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers or energy industry is very critical to creating jobs, creating wealth, creating prosperity, and the windfall surplus that we enjoy, enjoy uh, this year, that's because of our energy sectors. And leaders, stakeholders in that sector are warning this government that this job-killing sovereignty act will not help their industry. It's scaring investment away. It's scaring investors away. But again, the government still refuses to listen. Three treaty chiefs, six, seven, and eight, they spoke out against this bill in the best government could do to address their concern is to point out to a clause in this piece of legislation as if those chiefs didn't read that clause. And if government thinks that clause is enough to address their concerns, then I would suggest that their uh, joint presser they did, the concern they ra raised, clearly shows how indigenous communities don't trust this government. They fundamentally lack any trust, any faith in this government. Instead of engaging with them, respectfully, meaningfully. They are trying to read them a provision of the law that this will fix everything for them. That is very disrespectful. And then, a lot has been talked about the constitutionality uh, of this piece of legislation. And many have weighed in, who are even not constitutional scholars. Many constitutional scholars have weighed in as well. Uh, I also have a group of friends who are lawyers. They had a lively debate about it as well. But I think one thing is clear. Uh, 
that Section 96 of the Constitution gives federal government authority to appoint judges, superior court judges. And same section was interpreted by Supreme Court of Canada that this section also gives jurisdiction to those superior courts to decide constitutional issues. And that's in Constitution of Canada. And here we have a piece of legislation that gives this legislature authority to make opinions about constitutionality of Parliament's legislation. I think Section 96 would dictate that neither Parliament nor any legislature can pronounce and decide on constitutionality of any enactment. That role has been reserved for the courts, not for the legislature. That's in the Constitution, Section 96, and I urge members to uh, look up its interpretation by the Supreme Court of Canada. So, People are questioning the government's intention of bringing forward this bill. And the reason for that is that it doesn't do anything to help address, for instance, issues that we have with any federal piece of legislation. When we were in government, uh, well, C-69, we made submissions. We tried to make case. And when, in 2019, UCP became the government, they adopted and endorsed our submissions. That's one way of doing things. When we were in government, we started working on TMX. At that time, three in 10 Canadians were in favor of that. Then Premier, now the leader of the official opposition, went uh, all across uh, Canada to make a case about that pipeline, about our energy sector. And at the end of that tour, seven in 10 Canadians were in favor of that project. And when BC and when some other groups tried to throw roadblocks, we were able to push federal government to buy that pipeline. And now we are a few months away from that project to be completed. That will be first pipeline to tidal waters in 40 years. Conservative were in this province for 44 years. They had federal government for 10 years. They were not able to build a single pipeline to tidal waters. The lack of energy and infrastructure that is creating issues for us, that is the direct result of successive conservative government failures. They failed to stand up for the sector. And now they're coming up with this unconstitutional and completely absurd piece of legislation that will not do anything to help us. And Madam Speaker, there is another pretty interesting uh, thing about this bill, that this bill gives 30 days for anyone to challenge government decision in courts. And 
that's usually six months, but they decreased it to 30 days. And when court review government decisions, default standard is reasonableness. If there is an error of law, they will review decisions based on correctness standard. But what this government did, that they inserted a standard <coughs> how they want to be reviewed by the courts, and that's patent unreasonableness. Albertans expect their government to make decisions that are rational, that are reasonable, that are well thought out. And we got a government that set standard for themselves of patent unreasonableness. Are there others <laughs> to speak to amendments are a one on bill one? Seeing none, I will call the question on amendments are a one as moved by the Honorable Member for Edmonton Beverly Clairview. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, please say no. no. That is defeated. A division has been called. Ring the bells.
of the amendment, please stand. Ms. Sweet, Honorable Mr. Sabir, Ms. Goring, Honorable Mr. Egan, Honorable Ms. Sigurdsson, Member Loyola, Member Carson, Honorable Mr. Billis, Honorable Mr. Fian. All those opposed, please stand. Honorable Mr. Chandra, Honorable Mr. Copping, Honorable Mrs. Savage, Honorable Mr. Guthrie, Honorable Mr. Dreeshen, Honorable Mr. Taves, Honorable Minister LaGrange, Honorable Mr. Glubish, Honorable Mr. Ellis, Honorable Mr. Wilson, Honorable Mr. McIver, Honorable Mr. Jeremy Nixon, Honorable Mr. Luan, Honorable Mr. Jones, Mr. Williams, Mr. Hansen, Honorable Mr. Amory, Honorable Mr. Horner, Honorable Ms. Isaac, Honorable Ms. Pond, Honorable Mr. Yassin, Mr. Van Dyken, Honorable Mr. Jason Nixon, Honorable Mr. Orr, Mr. Walker, Mr. Smith. Madam Speaker, for the Amendment 9, against 26. Honorable members, that amendment has been defeated. We are back on the Bain Bill. Bill 1 in second reading. Are there members wishing to join the debate? The Honorable Member for Edmonton, Castle Downs. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Madam Speaker. It's my pleasure to rise tonight to speak to the main bill, uh, the Alberta Sovereignty Within a United Canada Act. Um, I'm disappointed that it was not um, supported, our motion. I thought that it was uh, quite, um, quite good in, in the fact that it uh, represented what Albertans are asking for, that this bill die. Um, so I'm just, I'm, I'm hopeful that uh, as we move through debate tonight, that government will do the right thing and uh, perhaps support us in another amendment. Um, we've already been able to articulate many reasons why this bill is, is not what Alberta needs. Uh, we talked about the importance of having a stable and <clears throat> reliable government. And unfortunately, this bill has signaled to so many um, international investors that Alberta is not a stable place to bring investment, and that's quite concerning. Um, we've, we've heard from the three treaty chiefs that this bill cannot proceed, yet this government um, is not listening to, to so many that are coming forward talking about the concerns that this bill brings, simply in its title. Um, Never mind the overreach and the, the gross powers that this government has, has put into this bill, but many things that is alarming to Albertans, to in investors, to uh, international investors, to business communities. Um, there's an endless list of people who have come out and spoke against this bill proceeding. And the opposition is listening. And we attempted to put forward uh, a reasoned amendment that unfortunately was, was just defeated, Madam Speaker. So um, I would like to move uh, an amendment. And I have um, it here with the copies and the original. And I will wait until you have it.
Honourable Members, this will be known as Amendment RA2. Honourable Member, please proceed to read it into the record. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, I move that the motion for second reading of Bill 1, Alberta Sovereignty Within a United Canada Act, be amended by deleting all of the words after that <clears throat> and substituting the following. Bill 1, Alberta Sovereignty Within a United Canada Act, be not now read a second time because the Assembly is of the view that the government has failed to adequately consult with nonprofit organizations and municipalities on the potential risks this bill presents to federal funding for their projects, including critical infrastructure and housing initiatives. So, Madam Speaker, it may come as a surprise to members of the UCP caucus and perhaps even members of the cabinet, but consultation didn't happen prior to the introduction of this bill. Uh, we shouldn't be surprised that based on reports that even after introduction, many of the members of cabinet hadn't read the bill. Clearly, there wasn't adequate consultation with the members of the government caucus. So it should come as no surprise that municipal leaders and nonprofit organizations were not consulted with. However, municipal and nonprofit leaders have been loud and clear that they have grave, grave concerns. Now I encourage members of this assembly to look into who is listed as a provincial entity under 1E, a municipal authority, an entity that receives a grant or other public funds from the government that are contingent on the provision of a public service. For each member across the aisle, how many of you have an entity in your riding that fits this? Did you talk to them before, they, before standing in full support of this bill? Let me provide you another quote, Madam Speaker. <clears throat> issues directives to a provincial entity and its members, of officers and agents, in respect of a federal initiative. When these entities are reading this, they are obviously concerned. There is no clarity on the intention of these directives, and no one has received assurances that the UCP government will not put federal funding at risk. Federal funding for affordable housing, federal funding for, to support newcomers, federal funding to pay their early childhood educators, to build playgrounds, ice arenas, music venues, all a part of every community. And when these organizations highlight concerns with the Sovereignty Act, the Premier tells them that they need to do more <laughs> internal consulting. It's pretty rich. With this amendment, the members of the UCP have an opportunity to do better to represent the constituents in their riding, to prove to Alberta, Albertans that they are listening. We had members of this cabinet, prior to becoming cabinet members, speak out against this bill. They talked about how concerned they were. They were all together in coming up with comments that said that this bill absolutely will not improve the economy of the Alberta. It's nothing more than a virtue signaling, a fiscal fairy tale that doesn't make any sense and won't work. Those comments came from a minister that sits in this chamber who now has changed their tune who is now singing the praises of this piece of legislation. So I'm just very concerned that they're not listening to their constituents. <coughs> Excuse me, Madam Speaker. They're not listening to Albertans. There's some significant concerns with proceeding with this bill. Again, the opposition is speaking on behalf of Albertans in speaking on behalf of business investors, <coughs> speaking on behalf of national investors, and asking the government to not proceed with this piece of legislation. We're asking that it not be read that there's nothing that is happening within this piece of legislation right now that is signaling that it should be 
something that goes forward. There are so many nonprofits across this province that should have voice. These are individuals that are relying on grants, they're relying on support from their government, they're relying on stability. The nonprofits in Alberta, I would argue, have been here prior to even the making of the province. These are people that volunteer their time, that work with people in every capacity across every constituency in this province. They work in the sports community, they work in arts, they work in religion, they work in food safety, they work in food security. They are working with the most vulnerable populations and doing the very best that they can to support Albertans right now. And having the information that they have not been consulted with is very, very concerning. Our municipal leaders, elected officials across this province, have not been consulted with. I would argue that they have a lot at stake when it comes to the passing of this legislation. How can we in good faith move forward with a piece of legislation that has not been consulted on? We've seen over the past few days government argue that we were, that we were wrong about the interpretation of this bill. We heard ministers come forward after they said that this bill would destroy the economy change their tune, but couldn't articulate why and what was better. We heard a premier say that we were wrong and then backpedal and say, well, we're going to change some things. We've heard loud and clear from Albertans, from industry, that the very introduction of this bill is dangerous. It does not benefit the economy. So there's absolutely nothing that could be introduced that would fix it. The damage is done. The only way, Mr. Speaker, that this government can show that they've been listening to Albertans is to stop this piece of legislation, to support the amendment that I've just introduced and not let this piece of legislation proceed. It should not be read a second time. When we know that consultation didn't even happen with their own cabinet. Mr. Speaker, that's concerning. We have a Premier that's putting forward legislation that she clearly didn't completely understand. Members of her caucus didn't understand. And for some reason, members of her cabinet were opposed to, but now suddenly agree with. I think the fact that our municipal leaders and our nonprofit sector not being consulted with is deeply, deeply concerning. This gives the government an opportunity to stop the chaos, to stop we need to be able to, to look to international investors and to small businesses and say, we heard you. We value the insight that you bring to this table, the expertise that you bring to this table. We've heard you loud and clear, and we are not going to proceed with the Alberta sovereignty within a United Canada Act. That is the only solution in this mess that was created by this government. It should not be read a second time. I would plead with members of government to vote in support of this reasoned amendment and show Albertans that they're listening, that they want to see success in Alberta. They want to see an economy thrive. And at this point, Mr. Speaker, the only way to do that and to, to signal to international investors and to anybody considering coming to Alberta, that they heard them, 
This is something that's deeply concerning, that this is the very first piece of legislation that's coming forward from this government when there's so much chaos already happening in the province. And to add to that chaos simply doesn't make sense. The only way to stop is to not proceed with reading this bill a second time. The very first piece of legislation from this government should address what Albertans need support with. Health care, housing, affordability. All of that is what Albertans are talking about. Not asking a government to create more chaos and to disrupt potential investors from coming here. There's so many projects that are in the process right now of coming to Alberta. I would be curious to know how many are paused because of this act? How many investors are looking at what's happening in the province and not even remotely considering coming to Alberta? How many investors are being scared away because of the simple introduction of this piece of legislation? And that damage can't be undone if we proceed with this piece of legislation. No matter how they wanted to reframe it or, or introduce amendments, it's not possible. The mere introduction of this legislation is the damage. When investors look to where they want to put their hard-earned money and their families that are going to come to support their business here, when they see a government that is in chaos and is putting forward legislation that gives such sweeping powers to them and disregarding the economic impact, why would they invest in Alberta? Why would they come here? There are so many other options for them. And it's simple. All this government has to do is not have this bill read a second time. Support what Albertans are asking for. Support what investors are asking for and not proceed with this bill. It, it just it boggles my mind that we have so many people that want to be part of the economic conversation and so many that are coming forward saying, please, we have, we have ideas, we have solutions. And this wasn't one of them. Creating chaos and instability cannot be the right answer. I would please request that everyone in this chamber support this amendment. Thank you. On amendment RA2, the honourable member for Edmonton, Beverly Clairview. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I smile because I heard from the other side someone would love to call the question. I could talk about this bill all night. Um, and in fact, when it moves to committee, I will. And I hope the minister will be in chamber because I will talk your ear off. Uh, and in fact, uh, through the speaker, of course. Um, that's a trait that I have passed on to my daughter, Mr. Speaker, where she's also uh, quite chatty. But um, <clears throat> regardless, I'm standing here to uh, support this reasoned amendment. And I'm going to go through, Mr. Speaker, and outline my, my reasons for it. And um, as I said to my good friend, the member for Drayton Valley, Devon, um, I, was, I was itching to get up and, and intervene on his speech, and I appreciate his comments, um, and I appreciate his concerns. And so what I'm going to do, Mr. Speaker, is, is try to address some of those. Um, and others. And, and the reason that I'm supporting this reasoned amendment and why I, I don't support this bill, and, and quite frankly, Mr. Speaker, it comes down to investor confidence. My, all of the arguments I'm going to lay out in the next 13 and a half minutes have to do with investor confidence. And it's not about the constitutionality of this bill. And I appreciate uh, the member for Drayton Valley, Devon, outlining some of his rebuttals. Um, behind that argument, and I appreciate that, and I mean that sincerely. I think uh, too often in this chamber, as of late, uh, we've gotten away from debating policy and giving 
arguments as to why we accept or refute the other side's uh, opinion and, and points. And we've gotten into a name-calling, uh, hyper-partisan um, discussion, which, quite frankly, I don't think Albertans have the appetite for it. I think they're tired of it. I think rightly so. I didn't get into this job to call people names. Um, it's about building it. And so the reason that I support this amendment to stop this bill is not about the constitutionality of it. Okay? And I appreciate <laughs> this is how lawyers make their bread and butter, and, and no offense to the lawyers in the room, uh, but they can debate this until the cows come home and, and interpret law. For me, the, the challenge with this bill, and regardless, Mr. Speaker, if, if the government and the Premier brings in amendments to fix some of the more challenging sections of the bill, that's not the issue I have with it. The issue I have with it is <clears throat> the province of Alberta putting forward a sovereignty act to be able to have two different sets of rules to play by is going to be a deterrent to investors coming to Alberta. Because when they look at Canada and they look at the different provinces, investors want certainty, they want stability, they want predictability. And when you have one order of government bringing forward a bill that challenges the authority of another order of government in name, that that's a red flag. And I don't expect our international investors to go through the bill and read it and understand the nuances and translate it. They're going to see, and rightly or wrongly, me the media has covered this bill enough that international investors understand that Alberta's brought forward a bill to challenge uh, federal government. And so, the challenge with that is that that will be a deterrent. Now, we all know that provinces have the ability to challenge the federal government through the courts. We've always had. We need that. We absolutely need that. We need to be able to hold the federal government to account. We need to be able to ensure that they don't overreach. And there have been times, and many times, in Alberta's history where we've challenged the federal government and we've been successful, as we should. We need to protect Alberta's interests. We need to stand up for the province. All of us in this chamber agree with that. The, the, the question here is, what is the best mechanism to do that? And my concern, even when you know, the Premier has said that there will be amendments coming forward, and I'll, I'll talk about the cabinet process, having been a cabinet minister, I have serious concerns uh, with where we're at, government-wise. But the point is, even if the government neuters this bill and, you know, takes out any kind of teeth, which is what's one of the concerns of international investors, um, the point is you still have a sovereignty act that is questioning and putting questions into the minds of investors of the two, two different orders of government having two sets of rules. Every international investor I've talked to wants simplicity, they want predictability, and they want stability. And when you say to an international investor, well, we're going to have two different sets of rules, one's going to be for this province with the federal government, but much of the rest of the country and I'm going to carve out a caveat right now on Quebec, and I will talk about Quebec. What do you say about the that that will deter investors from selecting Alberta. It will. Investors want to know that there's stability. Let me let me let me give you an example, okay? So there are lots of energy companies that when Donald Trump came into power, that talked about how he was going to reverse all the climate policies and allow 
coal to continue under, under his government in perpetuity. Do you think the companies opened a whole bunch of, of coal mines and continued down that path? No. You know why? Because they recognize that that kind of investment is a 50-year investment, and Donald Trump will be long gone. And it's not even about Donald Trump. I'm not attacking him. Any politician will be long gone over a 50-year span. So these companies are looking at what is the long-term investment. My point is, when I'm, on a, when I'm on a roll, just let me roll. And I appreciate the <laughs> chirps that are going on over there. Listen, folks, 15 minutes is not enough time. My daughter would tell you 15 minutes is not enough time. Um, so the point is, the, 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 the predictability and stability investors are looking for go far beyond an individual political party or a four-year mandate. In fact, that's probably the biggest concern that they have. Um, so for me, even if this bill is, you know, amended or potentially improved, the risk still exists that you have a piece of legislation called the Alberta Sovereignty Act. And I can tell you, and I know that very few people that I'm looking at in this chamber have spoken to international investors in the whites of their eyes in their home country. I mean, largely in part, this is not an attack on the government. COVID has inhibited them from traveling internationally. <laughs> investors will tell you that they're not about to read the legislation. They're about to see that the current provincial government is trying to establish a separate set of rules from the Canadian government. And that's problematic. Now, I'm not saying the spirit behind this bill to give Alberta additional tools to stand up to a federal government and quite frankly, I would argue it doesn't matter if it's liberal or conservative. I can tell you that there are conservative governments in Canada who have acted against the province of Alberta. I'll give the minister, who loves to chirp when I speak, a great example. Which government initiated the regulations to phase out coal in this country? It was Jason Kenney and Stephen Harper. And if you shake your head, go and look at Federal Hansard. They initiated six out of 18 coal-fired plants were to be phased out. I, I hesitate to interrupt my good friend from Edmonton, Beverly, Clairview. However, we are on Amendment RA2, <laughs> which very specifically speaks to uh, that the Assembly is of the view that the government has failed to adequately consult nonprofit organizations, municipalities on the potential risks of the bill. It goes on, uh, it says very little uh, about any of the topics in which he has discussed up to this point, and I provided a pretty wide latitude. However, uh, the Honorable, the learned member who's been in this house for ooh, a dec more than a decade will know that. Um, that at no point in time during his tenure has a, a caucus moved two reasoned amendments to a piece of legislation. And while it is within the right of the members to do so, uh, I think it's reasonable to expect that the relevancy of their remarks will be specific to the amendment. The Honourable Member for Edmonton, Beverly Clarby. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And my point in this is that governments have a significant influence over the uh, investments that come to a province. And so I see that I have a colleague of mine who is interested in intervention. I'll give way. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Member. I appreciate the opportunity to ask you a little bit. I noticed that you were talking earlier about uh, uh, the fact that Quebec has, has uh, 
over the years made a number of uh, moves in this particular direction. But one of the things that we've learned in an evaluation of Quebec is that they really haven't recovered properly from uh, their sovereignty uh, attempts in this um, in this country, and uh, as a result, uh, they're quite a bit farther behind economically than they would have been otherwise. And I'm wondering if you might have some uh, further comments uh, about, uh, about uh, the, the ultimate consequence of taking this kind of a sovereignty approach. Thank you, colleague. Uh, Mr. Speaker, do you, sir, know roughly how much time I have left in this uh, debate? Four minutes and 37 seconds. Four minutes and 37, okay. Can't wait until this bill goes into Committee of the Whole, in which case, <laughs> Bring, bring your pajamas. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member for referencing Quebec because here is, here is a very important um, example of what happened. So the members talk about Quebec and how Quebec has stood up for their sovereignty. Are the members aware, and the Minister of Finance uh, is looking at me, and I appreciate that he will know this, Montreal and Quebec used to be the headquarters of all of the major financial institutions in Canada. All of them were in Quebec until they brought in a bill like this. And all of the headquarters moved out of Quebec and into Toronto. How many have moved back? None. How many are going to move back? None. They're going to stay in Toronto. And so the concern, I'll give way in a moment, member, the concern is that a bill like this could have long-term, long-reaching effects where we know that Alberta and Calgary is the home, is the number two city for headquarters for our financial sector. A bill like this could chase them out of Alberta. I'll give way. Well, thank you, member, <clears throat> for giving way. Um, and you, you, your premise of the speech is that there's one set of rules for the province and another for the federal government will cause confusion and investment will flee. I, I don't accept that premise. I think that's factually wrong. But if we give that to you and we say <laughs> this bill is not amendable, and we say it's not about the constitutionality, and this isn't a partisan question, it's purely pragmatic about investment, um, I think that evidence, I will posit the historical record of the NDP government in 2015. And I remember in Peace River, you guys brought forward your first budget, and the day after, Shell pulled out of the Carmen Creek investment, a $12 billion mega project, gone. No more investment came in afterwards. So whatever hypothetical you think is true here, how do you justify, if it's purely practical, and it has nothing to do with partisan politics, not coming to this side of the chamber and disavowing your role in the last government for the factual flee of capital out of this province, so much more devastating, so much more devastating than any hypothetical you could dream up that may or may not happen from this. It's practical, honorable member. Please answer. Uh, Mr. Speaker, well, first of all, the member is factually incorrect. Second of all, as I've, I've, I've said, I've spoken with a number of executives from some of the largest oil and gas companies in Alberta and Canada who have said that the Alberta NDP did more for the oil and gas sector than the current UCP government has in the last three and a half years. No, no laugh it up because you've, you've drank the Kool-Aid. Look, look at the royalty review. Can any member in this chamber tell me what the royalty structure was before 2015? because I bet you, you'd have to struggle to get it, and I'm even looking at former ministers. We modernized the royalty review where we made it more, um, we incentivized oil and gas companies to continue through the life of the well when productivity declined. Because previous to our, our royalty modernization, most companies sealed off wells because they paid the same royalty level when the well was producing 100% as it was producing as it tailed it off. And so they capped it. We modernized it. We listened to the oil and gas sector. And, and let me tell you, there are lots of New Democrat members who were quite frustrated with us because they thought we were giving too many breaks to the energy sector. What we did was we charted a course that was fair to our oil and gas producers but also ensured that they would continue through the life of the well 
which was also a boon for Alberta taxpayers. I can tell you that this bill in its current state, regardless of what's written in it, has chilled investment. And I appreciate the member from Peace River respectfully disagrees. But this is where I will say to the member of Peace River, are you talking to the international investment community the way that we are? And I'm not trying to pull a card. I'm saying as a former Minister of Economic Development Trade, I'm speaking to international investors that I spoke to when we were government, and they are scared. The Sovereignty Act has just placed question marks into the viability of investing in Alberta. And that even questioning of is Alberta a predictable place to invest in has chilled investment. And so, therefore, our government, I won't give away this time, member, <laughs> our, our, our party will not, uh, sorry, this is why we brought forward a second reason amendment, because no matter what amendments the government brings, the chill on investment will not end until this bill is repealed. I'm all for having a conversation on what other tools can we come up with to ensure that Alberta and Albertans are um, a priority. And I don't disagree that there have been times where Ottawa is overreached and we need to stand up for Alberta. But the bill, this, this tool or mechanism is not the way to stand up for Alberta. And my fear is that, like Quebec, it's going to have long-term consequences on Alberta. All of the financial headquarters of Canada moved out of Montreal. Quebec has been reeling from the impacts of their bill for 40 years. I love this province. I'm an Albertan. I'm born and raised here. I do not want our province to suffer for decades because of a bill that maybe was good intentioned, but is not going to deliver the outcomes that the current government thinks it's going to. And the unintended consequences far outweigh the benefits that this government may think this bill is going to deliver for Alberta. And for those reasons, Mr. Speaker, I'm supporting this reasoned amendment and cannot support this bill moving forward. Honourable Members, uh, on Amendment RA2, I see the Honourable Member for Great Valley Devon is on his feet, at which I will call momentarily, followed by the Honourable Member for Edmonton Manning. But I do want to reiterate that members of the Assembly, um, it, it is not the convention of the Assembly to continue to propose reasoned amendments and then speak to the main bill. Uh, so it will be a requirement of members, if they want to propose multiple reasoned amendments, that they speak specifically to the amendment, not just broadly speaking, as we just saw from the Honourable Member for Edmonton Beverly Clairview, about, uh, about the main motion. There will be plenty of time for that in the future. The Honourable Member for Drayton Valley, Devon, should he choose to speak to the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I won't take long, um, but I would like to speak to the reasoned amendment here. The, as you rightly have pointed out, the uh, reasoned amendment here is dealing with the potential risks this bill presents to federal funding for the projects, including critical infrastructure and housing initiatives. Mr. Speaker, I believe that uh, in this reasoned amendment, the argument that they're making is that this bill is, is, uh, is going to be impacting our relationship with the federal government and that it's going to affect things like critical infrastructure and housing. And therefore, uh, we should uh, vote in favour of this reasoned amendment to stop the bill from going forward. Yeah, I believe that uh, the previous member, um, I appreciated the comments that he had to say. 
it's true that uh, uh, when ever governments make decisions, there are potential consequences to those decisions and to the legislation that they pass. I can remember when I got elected the first time in 2015, uh, this young social studies teacher, or younger social studies teacher, um, uh, went from being in his classroom on the day the election was called in 2015 to a month later being in his constituency office. And within the first couple, two, three months, I think I had five oil and gas companies. Their CEOs coming into my office and I'm going, why are these important people coming to see a, a little MLA like me? And, uh, and every one of them had the same message. That the decisions that governments make do have consequences. And that every business in the oil and gas industry, at least the five that came through my, my constituency office, said, you know, every time we make a decision about how we spend money, we make a, uh, we do a risk analysis. And then they went on to proceed to talk about royalty reviews and carbon taxes and increasing corporate tax rates and, and all of the things that the Alberta government under the New Democratic Party were starting to do. And their message was very simple to me. We can spend our money anywhere in the world and we're choosing not to spend it in Alberta. So I, I agree with the, the member from uh, that was speaking just before me here when he says that predictability and stability are important things to have and that the decisions of government can make a, a huge impact. Uh, obviously in this amendment they're, they're worried about federal funding for the projects including critical infrastructure and housing and yet I would draw to their attention that Bill 1 we've said very clearly is about creating a shield. That this is about protecting Alberta. That we have had a, a history over many, many, many years of the federal government passing legislation that has overreach to the point where it's affecting Alberta in, in very significant ways. Passing legislation that even the Alberta uh, the Alberta uh, courts have, have ruled as are unconstitutional, is unconstitutional. This is not a sword. Bill 1 is not a sword. It's a shield. It's about protecting Albertans from the overreach of a federal government that has refused to recognize that it, it has certain constitutional lanes that it has to stay in. And then when it doesn't, you're right, it does affect the predictability and the stability. And so we've had to come, and yeah, we've had to be a little creative, but we've brought before the people in this legislature Bill 1 that will allow us to create a shield that will protect the citizens and the economy of Alberta from the unpredictability that comes when a federal government begins to overstep its constitutional boundaries as it passes legislation. And this bill is allowing us to be able to say, if you are going to do that, if you are going to pass legislation that's going to threaten the economy of Alberta, that's going to create instability, that's not going to allow for businesses to have predictability, if you are going to do that, then we, as the legislature of Alberta, will use this act to protect us and to protect the citizens and the businesses and the constitutional rights of Albertans through a debate and motions in this legislature, we will bring forward motions that will deal with the individual indiscretions of the federal government as they pass legislation that is outside of their constitutional boundaries. I hesitate to interrupt the member, but what is fair for the goose, in fact, is fair for the gander. And uh, I, I'm having a hard time understanding how your comments specifically relate to RA2, which very specifically discuss about consultation with nonprofit organizations, municipalities, the potential risk that the bill pr presents. 
if the member wants to speak to the main bill, he's welcome to do so. If he wants to speak to the amendment, particularly now that we're moving into additional reasoned amendments, he ought to be speaking specifically to the amendment. The Honourable Member for Drayton Valley Duff. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I apologize if I've strayed into uh, the indiscretions of other members earlier today. Um, uh, my point was this, that uh, in creating a shield in Bill 1, it is that. It's a shield, and it's there to try not to create a, a, a situation where federal funding for projects like critical infrastructure and housing initiatives will be threatened, but will keep the federal government in their constitutional lane. And when we each stick to our constitutional lane, then the discussions about how are we going to fund critical infrastructure our highways, etc. Then the funding discussions between the federal government and the provincial government on housing initiatives and where that money is going to come from, then those are productive discussions. But if we can't have a shield that protects Albertans from the indiscretions of government, of federal government, passing legislation that overreaches their constitutional uh, boundaries, then it's then that we begin to get relationships between the federal and the provincial governments that threaten to have productive conversations on the kinds of critical infrastructure and housing initiatives that are important for all of us to be able to um, uh, benefit by across this country. So uh, with those comments, I thank uh, this House, I thank the Speaker for your, uh, your attention, and uh, uh, we will continue the debate uh, through other people. Thank you. Member for Edmonton Manning. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I will uh, try to stick to the amendment that is currently in front of us. And, you know, I believe that, that it's important that this be supported in the House, and part of that is it's the consultation with nonprofit organizations and municipalities on the potential risks that this bill presents to federal funding for their projects, including the infrastructure and the housing initiatives. But if we look at the section that it's referencing, it actually speaks to Section 1E, which includes municipal authorities and an entity that receives a grant or public funds from the government that are contingent on the provision of a public service, which is what this amendment is speaking to, or this referral is speaking to. Now, the reason that I feel like this is very important is that I've spent, again, like I said earlier today, since this bill's been introduced, speaking to my stakeholders. And my stakeholders have been clear that they don't understand how this is going to have the impact on their sector in relation to the partnership with the federal government. They haven't been consulted. They haven't had those conversations. And, you know, it's, it's a pretty significant piece. When we look specifically just at the egg societies alone, which would fit under this section of the Act, and have not been consulted. The very funding that they receive would include the Canadian Alberta Jobs Grant. They receive the Energy Savings Grant. They get funded by FarmSafe. They get funded for local festival grants. They get community anniversary grants. They get Canadian Greener Homes Grants. Many of those grants are partnerships between the province and the federal government. Now, we've heard from the Premier in, in recent weeks about mandate letters that have been sent to ministers and, and she s spoke even in this house during question period about encouraging her ministers to come up with motions that would speak specifically under this act that could be addressed. Yeah. Well, when that happens and we look at the grant funding that is being offered to many of these nonprofits that are under the minister's purview, there raises questions around what is going to happen with that partnership with the federal government and the provincial government when it comes to securing those grants. Now, again, because the industry hasn't been consulted, we are talking about crit critical infrastructure. We can look at the irrigation partnership that is being funded under the CAP program. 60% of that is federal, 40% of that is provincial with a little bit of the municipalities' partnerships. That is a direct partnership and relationship between the federal government and the provincial government. Those projects, those planning grants, all of the things that are associated with the irrigation network specifically, as one example, could be something that should be discussed with the irrigation networks prior to looking at this act and explaining 
to the irrigation networks, what this means for the partnership that the minister is going to have to have with the federal government. Is this going to be a motion that he may have to bring forward into the House to talk about area management agreements, land management, the partnership that the federal government has around endangered species or protecting the looking at invasive species? Those issues directly relate to the partnership with the irrigation networks, which directly relates to the grant money that directly relates to this specific amendment saying that those consultations never occurred. I'd be curious from the minister if he sat down and had a conversation with the irrigation networks about the potential impacts on the Sovereignty Act and what that means for their investment. So that's just one example. We could look at, if we want to, go back to the annual report for agriculture and forestry and look at the fact that $42 million was, was given through the CAP funds invested in 21 to 22. And that was $42 million um, for sector capacity, industry growth, risk management for multiple care objectives, um, including the outcomes of the, annual, the actual areas of farm efficiency, environmental management, growth and value add, public trust, but doesn't include the administration fee. And then the modernization and streamlining of programs, such as service delivery standards, um, and including transparency of the industry which goes back to my earlier remarks that I made in regards to how this act is going to impede potentially the reputation of the agriculture industry at our international markets. How are we going to ensure that the conversations that are happening, that when we're working with CFIA around our food inspection, that our export markets, that our international partners believe that Alberta is still standing up and doing the appropriate things. Many of those things are partnerships. Many of those uh, individuals are producer groups that are going to be significantly impacted if the government chooses to start using motions in this house and start creating disagreements with the federal government. This is a significant amount of investment money. I do want to acknowledge though that because um, of all the money that was transferred, maybe the minister's not as concerned because he actually didn't use the full federal transfer budget last year. So, left some money on the table, it's in your report, Minister, uh, that there was a shortfall and it didn't actually all get spent. Now, under the cap, we saw $3 billion of federal, provincial and territorial funding investment into agriculture and the agri-food sector. That was from uh, effective April 1st, 18 to 2023. Now, more than $400 million of that will be invested over the five-year period for agri-food and agri-product-based industries, but again, 60% of that funding is coming from the feds, 40% of that is coming from provincial governments. So again, working closely with our, with our producer groups, as indicated within the annual report, that the minister will continue to work closely with the industry to support growth and diversification <laughs> using that federal dollar transfer. So was the consultation happening? What is going to guarantee these organizations that are currently going to be receiving that amount of money through their grant transfers that they're going to continue to have that? Has that guarantee, has that conversation happened with those producer groups? Now they receive grants so they qualify under this amendment. That was part of the consultation piece. When I talk to stakeholders, they haven't had those conversations. They're not aware of all of these different impacts that are going to happen. Of course, we could talk about agri stability and agri recovery and the partnerships that happen with that and the fact that, you know, 322 producers had to sign up due to the severe drought and that $1.5 million was paid out in the 2021 program year. We could also talk about the Canadian federal provincial uh, territorial agreement that happened on the reference margins, also significant federal transfers that impact direct producers. We could also talk about the $9.28 million that was required that was used to help with the livestock producers, crop and forage producers, beekeepers and mixed farmers, all which should have been consulted with under this legislation before it was introduced. Now, of course, $400 million of dollars, um, was also allotted from the federal government for agri recovery specific to livestock feed, the initiative which I believe the minister just put some more money into. Thank you for that. But again, that is a grant program that is administered by the, by the Livestock Feed Association through a grant, which is dependent on the relationship between the federal government 
and the province. Now, of course, when we had a severe drought, $352 million was provided under Phase 1 and then Phase 2 of the CLFA, um, which covers about 2 million animals in the province. And also the beekeepers with $1.9 million to help with uh, drought-caused low forage. So those are significant things, impacts many of the minister's stakeholders. Now, on top of that, there's also federal funding to support FarmSmart, which includes vegetation management, prescribed fire, fire smart planning, and general wildfire prevention projects with Indigenous communities. And we've already heard from many of our colleagues here that the Indigenous communities are not feeling like they've been consulted on this piece of legislation. And in fact, that is a significant investment, $1.3 million to work with Indigenous communities on fire. Significant. But yet, clearly from my colleague, it was mentioned that the Indigenous community doesn't feel like they were consulted. But those conversations didn't happen. They don't know what's going to happen with their Fire Smart grant and how that's going to work with the Indigenous partnerships that were created through the federal government. And of course, my favourite, the Mountain Pine Beetle. Also significant funding that comes from the federal government. $1 million was allotted to help control, oh, $60 million, sorry, was the cost share with the federal provincial agreement to enhance the Mountain Pine Mountain Pine Beetle Management Program, with additional funds um, also being obtained by $1 million from our lovely colleagues in Saskatchewan because they don't want the Mountain Pine Beetle. So what does that look like? How do those partnerships, not just with the federal government, but with our interprovincial partnerships that we have with BC and Saskatchewan? Money transfers back and forth between governments all the time to ensure that we are, in, we are protecting our environmental oh. sustainability. Of order is noted. The Honourable Member for Peace River. Rise on Standing Order 23B, speaking to a question um, other than under discussion. I've yet to hear anything about the second reason amendment, Mr. Speaker, um, and I'd be very happy to hear more about it. Uh, I'm, I'm not convinced you're listening then. The Honourable <laughs> Member for Edmonton Manning, because largely all of her remarks have been on the reason amendment. The Honourable Member for Edmonton Manning. Sort of like reading the bill, Minister. Yeah, just like reading the bill, clearly not paying attention. So again, as I'm speaking to this, there, there is significant transfers that are happening between the different provinces. Now, the other thing that I think is significant that we need to look at is the revenue from the Government of Canada was $270 million more than budgeted in the last budget by the Minister. And part of that was because of the fact that we had such a significant drought in the last season. So there was another increase of another $253 million for agriculture income supports for the Canadian Alberta Livestock Feed Assistance Program in response to the provincial-wide drought and increased funding of $22 million for agri insurance due to increased commodity prices and insured acres. Now, additional funding of $2 million was also provided due to increased wildfire activity on federal land. So the feds helped us out. That's good. It's their land. And these increases were partly offset by lower funding of the pine beetle. So there was actually significant changes from the 2021 actuals. The revenue for the Government of Canada was actually increased to the province by $236 million, mostly due, again, to the Canadian Alberta Livestock Feed Assistance Program. Significant transfers from the federal government and so I had, go ahead member <coughs> well thank you um, uh, honorable member from uh, Edmonton Manning and uh, you know what you've been describing in regards to <coughs> the federal uh, grant funding and um, you know whether it has the potential risk for um, the this this funding to to uh, uh, be gone right uh, using uh, this new Sovereignty Act and you know, I would like to just ask two things or put two things out like how do we have an Perhaps an aggregate of how much money is it at stake in the agriculture industry? Um, from federal I mean you don't have to do the math now, but you know like I see a pattern um, For example in post-secondary where it's almost as though this provincial government's been taking the Sovereignty Act out for a test drive for years now leaving money at the table because of not matching grants that come from the federal government to fund post-secondary, child care, a whole range of things where literally those programs and that money that was meant for Alberta families was left on the table because this government was failing to uh, 
uh, put forward the matching funds, right? So it was almost like kind of, you know, Sovereignty Act soft version of it. And here we are today. <clears throat> well, thank you, uh, Honourable Member. Actually, I do have the numbers. Yeah. Yeah. So the total budget for the federal transfers was $46.8 million. It was not fully spent. To give the minister some leeway, it was due to supply chain disruptions that, but, that were experienced by many of the grant recipients, partly because of COVID. So I'll give you that. So 42 was spent. 42 million was spent, but not, and there was 46.8 million in total that was transferred. COVID got in the way, supply chains got in the way, but all of that is grant funding. That is a significant amount of money. Now, on top of that, we also have the Alberta Employment Training Funding Program. So the Canadian Alberta Grant Job Grant is a federal provincial partnership under which Alberta employers and government share the cost of training new and existing employees, and the program contributes up to about 15,000 per trainee per employee. Again, partnership that exists for agriculture and other jurisdictions in regards to supporting new employment growth in the province. On top of that is the Alberta Jobs Now program, which is about $370 million to private, non-profit businesses, just so the member is aware I'm talking about non-profits, to support much-needed jobs for underemployed and unemployed Albertans across the province. Employers will be able to apply for the grant that covers 25% of an employee's salary or training costs up to a maximum of $25,000 per employee. The second applicant intake for this program is actually at the end of the month. Um, so those are a couple other grant programs that have significant impact for our nonprofits. They help get people into the workforce, and yet nobody was consulted with that. Now we look at the federal, uh, federal transfers that also exi exist. So the Accelerate Investment Incentive, another one. The Accelerate Investment Incentive was introduced in 2018 as a means to encourage investment in capital assets. This incentive was to enhance first-year allowance for certain property that is subject to capital cost allowance rules. I'm sure the Minister of Finance thinks that's good. Manufacturing and processing machinery and equipment acquired was available from 2018 until 2024 and up to use till 2028. Um, this would encourage any property that uh, would allow businesses to immediately write off the full cost of machinery and equipment used for manufacturing or processing of goods. And these measures are scheduled to be phased out between 2024 and 2027. So again, for those who are looking at agri-food, any of those investment companies, any, any of our producer groups that are trying to look at trying to uh, set up greenhouses, any of our horticultural industries, any of those things, much. And I have many, many, many more, but I see I am running out of time. Thank you. Are there others on amendment RA2? The Honourable Member for Edmonton Rutherford. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to this referral amendment, and I quite enjoyed the uh, speech just given by the member from Edmonton Manning, and I intend to take some of my time to kind of uh, follow up on what she said. She uh, clearly has given numerous examples of uh, federal initiatives that are in jeopardy uh, when um, we look at what could potentially happen with this, this act and, and uh, clearly has outlined in depth many reasons why uh, this bill should not proceed for, forward uh, as it threatens institutions here in the province of Alberta. And I, I want to speak about the, the underlying uh, fundamental argument that is inherent in the e extremely well uh, articulated set of um, examples that were given by the member and because it it um, it is uh, a concern that is e expressed across uh, a number of different groups of, of uh, people uh, whether they be stakeholders or whether they be uh, First Nations or whether they be um, uh, Nonprofit institutions here in the in the province of Alberta, that the intent of this act is to, uh, as the member from Devon says, um, 
is to be a shield for the province of Alberta. However, um, in the actual construction of the bill, it is clear that it's only a shield for a very select few of people. For everyone else, it's a sword. For everyone else, the, the outcome is likely to be that they will find themselves at the losing end of um, this situation. And the reason why is because the bill is, talks about the fact that they will only use it to protect the public interests here in Alberta. But what it doesn't do is it doesn't clearly outline what public interest means. And, and I'm not asking for a definition of public interest. What I'm, I'm uh, saying is that the nonprofits and the First Nations and uh, the farmers and other groups in the province of Alberta have learned quite clearly that often when the public interest is raised as a reason for um, some kind of action on the part of the government. It turns out it is not, in fact, the wider public interest, but the interest of a very narrow or select few within the public. And this government has been really consistent on that, consistently moving money from the poor to the rich, moving power from the collective to individuals within government, and, and um, that has made people nervous. Uh, you know, I had a chance I earlier in the House today to talk about Grand Chief Arthur Noski saying that they learned from the uh, first bill brought in by this government that, um, uh, th that uh, the bills were not written for First Nations. They know that because uh, the bill was intended to stop protesters who were trying to protect treaty rights. And he said, we can see that it wasn't written for non-Indigenous people because they certainly didn't use it at the Coots border crossing. And so he said, given that experience with this government, we understand that we do not fit into public interest when the bill uh, it, it suggests that. And this is the underlying uh, issue that all of these organizations have. And they've seen it in many other places. And we've heard uh, from the member from Edmonton Manning articulate many examples when the, uh, the current government has failed to work cooperatively with the federal government to bring dollars into this province. And I can tell you I've certainly heard that too when I go around, uh, around the province, that this government has made the decision not to accept federal dollars because they want to stand off from them. And the consequence is that people here in this province lose out. I know, for example, um, that this, this, this provincial government is one of the very last governments in this province to uh, accept uh, any kind of a deal at all on childcare which meant for months, even uh, uh, up to a year, people who could have had their child care uh, subsidized did not get it subsidized. They lost money. They personally lost money. And then when it was brought into the, the province, the intent of the federal legislation was undermined because this government had a different idea of how child care should be funded. And one of the consequences was, when I went and visited, for example, the Calgary Métis Family Services, was that their lowest income uh, participants in their child care were actually charged more money under the Alberta program than they were previously to the Alberta program coming in. So the very poorest of the poor were the ones who ended up by paying more. They did not feel like they were part of the public interest at that time. And that's the reason for this amendment. The amendment is that this government has not consulted appropriately with a wide range of Albertans to ask how they might understand public interest to include that wide range of Albertans. And as such, the fear across nonprofits and across First Nations, across institutions in the, in the province of Alberta, is that this government isn't really interested in the broader public interest, but only the interests of a few 
within the public. And if the government can't understand that, they simply need to go to the communities out there that have been telling us over and over again that that is the problem. So we know, for example, in the First Nations community that they have articulated deep concerns about how this might affect their treaty rights. And we know that Section 2C was an attempt to say it won't affect treaty rights. But we also know that that doesn't hold any sway when the rest of the bill actually does affect treaty rights. Um, and they're, they're saying that, that that's, what, that's what concerns us and that's what is, is uh, going to be um, uh, the reason why they are standing up repeatedly to, uh, to ask that this bill be stopped. Uh, uh, Chief um, Tony Alexis from the Alexis First Nations, for example, has said, please, at least stop the bill until the time of an election. Because what he's asking for is a broad consultation about how will this affect the interests of the public. Whose public interests? That's the question that they're all asking. Whose interests are involved in the public interest? And it certainly isn't the First Nations, it certainly isn't the nonprofit societies, which is why we are asking this bill to be returned and, and to be stopped at this particular time. I see that there's an intervention. I will cede my time for a moment. Well, th well thank you, um, Honourable Member from Edmondson. Rutherford, and um, I, I, I like the way that uh, you are contextualizing this um, through the speaker, of course, because um, <clears throat> if, um, if it's not for so many people that you just described, and in, immediately your description made me think about, you know, to what degree is it for <clears throat> post-secondary, for students, for um, support staff, for research professors, um, for um, endowment contributors to post-secondary institutions. And again, you know, you see this insidious uh, reach by this UCP government over the last three years of, you know, uh, dictating um, where, um, you know, people make their money and uh, how they would, uh, you know, tolerate quite serious cuts without ever talking to the actual people who are affected by those decisions. <clears throat> Uh, thank you very much, uh, Member. I appreciate um, the intervention, and I think it's important that we recognize that there are a wide range of institutions in this province, and uh, post-secondary clearly is one set of, of interests in this province, but those interests are unique to post-secondary. They aren't necessarily the same interests that would be of concern uh, to, for example, um, uh, nonprofit societies or may not be the same as the interests of, uh, for example, people who are wishing to make investments in the, pro in the province from a, a profit motive. The point is that there are multiple interests. They have, um, uh, each group has different concerns that they need to protect, and each group will have to live with the consequences of this government deciding on their behalf what public interests are. And, what we've seen with this government is that they don't have the same values around post-secondary, for example, that the post-secondary institutions have. Uh, the post-secondary institutions have seen uh, massive, serious cuts in this province. The University of Alberta has lost somewhere in the neighborhood of $700 million uh, under this government's uh, 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 control. And, and they clearly do not feel like that is a, been doing anything uh, for the benefit of their faculty, of their students, of, or of their staff. Um, and, but they have no control because this government has decided what's in the public interest and has not allowed the people who actually know the most about education at the post-secondary level to make the decision about what public interest is. They have taken that power and brought it into the government where it should rest in the community and that's exactly the fundamental issue inherent in this bill is that this government is continually taking powers and moving it into the government we've seen them do this repeatedly over the last uh, uh, four almost four years now and um, and each time we stand up and say this is anti-democratic you are you are giving the power to ministers to make decisions about things that should be in the public sphere, 
especially in a, in a Westminster democracy. It should be brought into this house. It should be debated in this house. It should reflect the concerns and, and, and um, desires of people in, in the community. But this government has continually made the decision, no, we're not going to do that. We're not going to involve the people in the decision making. We're going to bring it in house. We're going to make the decision in our cabinet room. And in this bill, they're actually attempted, tempted to do that without any reference to the uh, Westminster democracy, of which we're all a part. They've been caught on that, and uh, apparently there is a possibility that we might see some, uh, uh, some changes to the bill uh, over uh, the next little while. But, of course, we haven't seen any yet. So uh, we, we, we can't really um, think that, that that is actually going to happen until it, it does. Uh, no evidence of it so far. And I, and I think that all we can go on then is what is the government's previous uh, behavior. Because the best predictor of future behavior is past behavior. And in this case, we've seen a government that has undermined uh, community values. I see that there's an intervention. Thank you very much, uh, member from Edmonton Rutherford. And through you, Mr. Speaker, to him, I'd, I'd just like to... Do, uh, highlight the fact that, again, this is, this is not new with this government. Over the last three years, we've seen a number of bills being proposed in this House where it's the centralization of decision-making power is put directly in the hands of ministers. And I would like your opinion. Like, I mean, the only reason why I would think that, that uh, this government would do that is because they're so focused on their own ideology and implementing their ideological approach in changing Alberta to fit what they believe is the only way, Mr. Speaker. And I believe that that just reeks of arrogance and it needs to be challenged. Thank you um, for that intervention. I think. Uh, you know, we, we've certainly laid out the argument for this referral amendment uh, that inherent in the referral amendment is a plea to go back to the community, to speak to the community about how it is that they will be affected and to not make decisions that ultimately are negative for the community. As uh, we've seen time and time again, as the member from Edmonton Manning articulated extremely well, as the people at the Calgary Métis Family Services told me about the child care, as the city of Edmonton experienced with regard to the province not cooperating with getting federal dollars for housing uh, at a time when we are experiencing some of the worst housing crisis in this province. We can go on and on and on and talk about the, the examples of when this government has really failed to understand that although they have an agenda, that it does not reflect the agenda of the vast majority of the population in the, in the province of Alberta. And, uh, you know, the polls that we see coming out right now are telling us quite clearly that that is true. Um, you know, it, it's funny, you know, we're, we're in this house and we're quite used in the house to having debates where um, we have this sort of both sides kind of argument going on where, you know, both sides introduce their experts and, and their commentators and say, well, our guy says this. But we're in a very funny situation here in this particular bill because for the first time in my life, I'm standing up, instead of saying my guy says this, I'm starting to say your guys say this. Your conservative commentators are saying things. I mean, it's interesting that, for example, that Corey uh, Tanaki, who was the, was the conservative strategist, uh, for the 2022 Ontario PC uh, election, he was a campaign manager, said it's, quote, it's fundamentally unconservative. Uh, and he said, quote, the solution to unconstitutionality is not more unconstitutionality. And, and here we are saying this over and over again, that we list the people who are conservatives in every other aspect, saying this does not reflective of who we are. However you've defined public interest is not reflected, not reflecting the conservative values or understanding of what public interest is. So if the left is saying this is not public interest, if the nonprofits are saying this is not public interest, if the First Nations are saying this is not public interest, and the conservative community is saying this is not public interest, whose interest is it? 
It's a very narrow ideological group of people that are having their interests being put forward. And that's the fundamental problem here in this particular case. I mean, we did see minister after minister come out against this particular bill. We saw the Minister of Treasury, um, the Treasury Board and Finance come out against it. We saw the Minister of Trade, Immigration and Multiculturalism come out against it. We saw the Minister of Jobs, Economy and Northern Development come out against it. We saw the Minister of Environment and, and Protected Areas come out against it. We saw the Minister of Municipal Affairs come out against it. We know all of them voted against the person who was going to bring this in. They tried to stop it. And not one of them has stood up and told us what it specifically is different about this bill than the one that they, they voted against. We know that the CEO of the Calgary Chamber of Commerce has come out against it. We know that the CEO of the Canadian Chamber of Commerce has come out, out against it. We know that the CEO of, of CAP, the Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers, has come out against it. And now we have the very successful campaign manager of the 2022 PC campaign in Ontario coming out against it. I mean, we literally have a list of all the people who should have been part of their community, who should have been saying, this is the right way to go. They are asking you to do exactly what we are asking you to do right now, and that is to stop this bill, to refer this bill out of the legislature, to seek to end this bill at this particular time um, and, and bring it back at another time uh, when we could have, uh, after we've had some proper consultation. And I know that, uh, that, for example, the Minister of Indigenous Relations has suggested that some consultation is going on, and yet uh, I've literally been on the phone uh, for, for days now talking to chiefs across this province who were telling me they haven't received a phone call. Uh, they haven't heard, heard uh, from the minister. So if there's consultation going on, it has not had time to, to go very deeply into the community and as such does not reflect the community's interests. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. On amendment RA2, are there others? The Honourable, the Minister of Agriculture and Irrigation. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, pleasure to rise and speak to this amendment. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion over the last few hours. It's uh, hard to remember where we started, but as in, in regard to this amendment and needing to consult with nonprofit organizations and municipalities, a lot was said previously about agriculture specifically. I can say, uh, you know, 70 different industry groups uh, one of the groups that was mentioned previously, the irrigation districts, I actually spoke to them today. They were so concerned they brought it up zero times while we, while we went through an, a laundry list of, of things that they were concerned about, that we're working, working towards. Uh, much, much was brought up about the relationship with the federal government uh, and the provincial government in regards to the CAP program. Uh, what going forward will be the SCAP program. Uh, and I can assure the opposition, I know they're very concerned. I think they, they believe, they they're misunderstand that uh, they think money was left on the table. That's not the case. It's a five-year program. It was signed on to by an NDP agriculture minister, and it rolls year to year. We'll be very sure to use all the money right up until the end of March before the next program starts. So I hope, I hope that provides a little clarity to, to how that actually works. The 60-40 relationship, it's an important one between the federal government and the provincial government. It touches on a lot of things. It touches on, you know, things, things that uh, they want to see moving forward, maybe protections in the environment, maybe efficiencies in irrigation, uh, but also the business risk management suite, which we're all very concerned about and want to ensure is very robust for our producers and can kind of answer changing landscapes economically for, for farmers in every different, every different part of the sector. Uh, something I did in a big way before I went to Saskatoon and eventually after a lot of, uh, uh, I would say, hard-fought negotiation on behalf of the province was consult with all of those industry groups. 
about the federal provincial relationship and that agreement specifically, we held our own roundtables during the Calgary Stampede where they begged me, don't even sign it if it's a bad deal. Please, please tell us that you're able to go there and dig your feet in the ground and don't let them back you into a bad deal. And it was usually around the idea that the federal government was going to push their uh, emission and, and environmental goals to the point of making the things that are most important to our producers, the, the production insurance, the agri-stability that, that will keep them in business when, when we get those bad years. They wanted to ensure that the federal government kept that out of those programs so they were actually still actuarially sound and made sense. That was the commentary and feedback that I heard in what I would call extensive consultations. But we did, we did go to Saskatoon. We did sign an, another five-year deal. I think there was a lot of, a lot of give and take. Um, in fact, at the, on the side of the road over a, over a Zoom call, I spoke to all of those uh, industry groups again to just explain to them the rationale behind why we, why we said yes to the things we did, what we gained on, what were our hills to die on, so to speak, and how we, how we came to an agreement. And in the end, the program was substantially increased. It hadn't seen an increase in over a decade, certainly not during the time when the NDP signed an agreement. We were able to see the money increased. We were able to, we were able to use it well, and we came to some real compromise. And I think that should be the goal of our relationship with the federal government. If, if you're going to, if, if, you're, if you're going to sit there and say all of those things are in jeopardy because the province of Alberta uses this act like a shield and then these things will be in jeopardy, well, then I'd say we probably have a bigger problem to talk about. Here, here. Here. Because we're, we're talking about a federal government supporting the, the agriculture sector across across the country. So if, if we have to worry about a five-year agreement that we signed on to uh, in, in, good, in good faith to deal with all of these things from uh, production insurance to the, to the environment and these, these pursuits that both of us, both of us share, if, if those are truly in jeopardy, what, what are we talking about here? I think we have a far bigger problem. And I would say that I didn't hear from any of those groups that they were concerned that they were concerned about this jeopardizing that, and if that if that if that is what those members are saying, I think maybe they should phone Jagmeet on the mothership and say what the heck's going on, boss? Unless unless that's your intention. If if that's if that's what you're saying, then come then come out and say it. But all all I would say. This, this amendment is silly. This bill's been talked about. We're here to stick up for Alberta. We're here to treat it like a shield. And if any of those things are in jeopardy, we have a far bigger problem. Here, here. Are there others on amendment RA2? I see the honorable member for Edmonton West Hindi on the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's a privilege to rise. Uh, early in the morning in the Legislative Assembly here uh, to speak to uh, the amendment before us, the recent amendment uh, again stating that uh, Bill 1, the Alberta Sovereignty within a United Canada Act, be not now read a second time because the Assembly is of the view that the government has failed to adequately consult with nonprofit organizations and municipalities on the potential risks this bill presents to federal funding for their projects. Uh, including critical infrastructure and housing initiatives. I didn't plan on reading all that, Mr. Speaker, but I did. Um, you know, there's, there's a, a few pieces within this uh, reasoned amendment that I uh, plan on supporting uh, for a number of reasons. And, you know, one of the uh, topics that stands out here and that has been discussed to some extent uh, at length is the relationship with the municipalities. Um, you know, we see even um, in Edmonton here, my uh, councillor has been vocal uh, about their concerns regarding Bill 1. Um, you know, kind of 
relating it back to imagine if we gave these types of powers to uh, obviously municipal governments are a little bit different but if we gave uh, these types of powers to the current mayor or the next mayor um, what kind of um, you know concerns that might raise and so again we have our own municipal partners raising concerns it's not only um, this battle that this uh, government is is considering taking up with the federal government but in um, whether it's uh, an innocent bystander or not mr. speaker are our municipalities that are going to be stuck right in the middle of this you know, when we talk about, and I think that the member from Edmonton Manning, as did many other members, uh, speak to several important programs that are potentially going to be put at risk or um, stakeholders that might be concerned about the changes being proposed in Bill 1, uh, the least of which, uh, or not the least of which, is uh, just looking back to some of the decisions that this government has made, and the previous member uh, made an important point about uh, housing that the city of Edmonton is now having to fund for themselves because the provincial government is not willing to take up uh, their role as a partner. And you know, at that time when, when those discussions have been happening over the last uh, uh, weeks, uh, the finance minister, the only thing that they could, uh, you know, put together was that there might be more funding in the next budget, which is uh, obviously an inadequate answer considering we are losing lives right now and this relates back to our relationship with municipalities and the need uh, to uh, adequately consult with nonprofit organizations because again when we look back to the relationship that this government this UCP government has had with the federal government uh, over the last several years and, and especially uh, through the pandemic obviously um, coming from very different directions, as the uh, member from Edmonton Rutherford uh, made a very clear point that this UCP government, uh, I think, makes many decisions that aren't um, in the general uh, or, or not generally popular with the majority of Albertans and are making decisions, whether it's about funding, whether it's about legislation that they're putting forward, uh, that clearly is not supported by the majority of Albertans. And in this case, through the pandemic, we saw money left on the table, uh, a report um, at the time, I believe it was January uh, 2021, showed that the uh, provincial government left uh, more than $675 million in federal uh, money on the table uh, for a number of programs, essential worker wage top-ups, uh, job training in hard-hit sectors, rapid housing initiatives, long-term care supports, uh, as well as help for early childhood educators. And I'm sure that list isn't extensive, but again, when we look at uh, the decision of this government to uh, not support the city of Edmonton in ensuring that there is adequate shelters and adequate funding for uh, potentially temporary uh, housing, um, they had an opportunity to fix this. Uh, and, and there was federal dollars on the table through the pandemic, specifically earmarked for rapid housing initiatives. But I think in this instance, uh, the provincial government didn't have an adequate plan in place uh, to access the entirety of those fundings. And the Minister uh, for Housing can correct me if I'm wrong, uh, maybe he wants to uh, make clear how many federal dollars were actually left on the table. Again, looking at the uh, report, it, it does say that it was because there wasn't an adequate plan in place to access those additional dollars. And so when we look at the relationship between the federal and provincial government and how it relates to uh, Bill 1, as well as, of course, how that is going to affect our municipalities who have to uh, bear uh, much of the costs of unhoused population, um, I think it's important to point out that the provincial government had an opportunity to work with the federal government, but for one reason or another uh, did not access those uh, tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of dollars for, uh, specifically in this case, rapid housing initiatives. And now we find ourselves in a situation where municipalities are having to fund that themselves. Uh, when we look at the issue around affordable housing or, or shelter space, or uh, even further, when we talk about, um, you know, rehabilitation and the direction that this government has taken I have grave concerns if the federal government is putting money on the table um, that because of uh, a disagreement about 
um, who should be uh, being able to accept that money, the, the type of person, whether they are um, you know, trying to get out of addiction, whether they are just at the, the front end of that process. There are so many questions uh, left to be answered about uh, what this government, again, in, in Section 3 under resolutions, uh, describes as anticipated uh, to cause harm to Albertans. I mean, I, again, it is such a, a general uh, concept or, or general uh, subsection that they've included in here. And, and beyond that, of course, Mr. Speaker, and I see an interjection that I'm happy to take. Thank you. I want to thank Mr. Speaker through you uh, to the member from West Tende. I'd like to uh, express my, my gratitude and really to all the members who have gotten up and spoken to this recent amendment and highlighting the implications of Bill 1 and how it could have a really drastic uh, impact on individuals within our own province here. And you know, the, the member from uh, Edmonton Rutherford, you know, was expressing how, well, it's not in the interest of Indigenous people, it's not in the interest of uh, the nonprofit organizations, and now the member from West Hende is talking about people, mo the, the most marginalized people in our society, people that need access to housing now. I don't think this government has given it enough thought about the implications that this sovereignty act and in the relationship that we have with the, the federal government. And, and I just find it astounding that, that hundreds of millions of dollars are being left on the table by this government. Uh, well, thank you for that, member, and I, I really do appreciate that, and I truly and completely uh, agree with that point, um, that there really seems to be many unintended consequences, not only uh, when we look at the economic consequences, but the consequences of our relationship with uh, nonprofit organizations, municipalities, as listed, listed in this reasonable amendment, and of course, uh, again, that's not an extensive list, but these are uh, some of the organizations and stakeholders who could be uh, dramatically uh, impacted by uh, the fight that potentially could take place uh, because of this legislation. And again, uh, looking back at the idea uh, that this uh, government and this cabinet wants to give itself such extraordinary powers, uh, specifically under the resolution clauses, uh, anticipated to cause harm to Albertans. Uh, how do you quantify that, Mr. Speaker, anticipated to? We're talking about changes that the federal government, uh, not only in this legislation, clearly shows that they have already taken, that's one thing, of course, Mr. Speaker, but that they are anticipated to take. So we don't even know that they're planning to do it. We haven't seen the legislation that the uh, cabinet and, and provincial UCP is, is saying that they might be doing. I mean, it, it seems... Uh, quite absurd, Mr. Speaker, and, and to uh, threaten our relationship with, with stakeholders and, and other uh, partners and levels of government is just uh, a recipe for disaster, Mr. Speaker. And, and again, looking at the uh, concerns around rapid housing initiatives and ensuring that, especially as things get colder and colder here, we've uh, seen a drastic drop. Um, that we should all be working together to ensure that things like uh, housing initiatives are moving forward and, and not held back because uh, a difference of in, uh, in opinion based on uh, you know this this current government's direction compared to the federal government compared to uh, previous provincial governments or municipalities. So it, it's quite clear that uh, through the discussions that we've had uh, on Bill One. Uh, this evening and, and previously that this government and this premier has not adequately uh, consulted with municipalities. Uh, that has become very clear from the, the comments that have been made by uh, municipal leaders in Edmonton and across the province. Uh, this government has not been able to show adequate um, adequate evidence that nonprofit organizations uh, have been consulted on this. It seems quite clear that they haven't been. And again, beyond uh, municipalities that are potentially going to be affected by this, as previous members have said, nonprofit organizations have a lot to lose in this fight uh, that this current UCP government uh, wants to uh, start as well. And again, I uh, understand, as previous members have, 
uh, that there are grievances that we have with the federal government. Uh, by no means uh, do I agree with many of the decisions that they make. Uh, but the fact is, when we talk about leaving money on the table, uh, this government, well, has done quite an exceptional job of that. Again, looking at the figure of $675 million uh, through uh, the, the pandemic that this government left on the table in federal funding uh, for for what, Mr. Speaker? Because they have a, a difference in opinion on uh, whether uh, essential workers should be getting a wage top up. I mean, these are decisions that have drastic impacts on uh, the people in our community. And so, Mr. Speaker, I think that the idea of the uh, early childhood educators and the uh, $10 a day uh, childcare funding agreement has come up as well. Uh, for one, that it took so long for this uh, provincial government to get that agreement in place. Um, it has impacts on Alberta families uh, as well as nonprofit organizations in our communities. Beyond some of those issues that I brought up, I, I know that uh, the issue of uh, climate change and, and taking action to uh, whether it be lowering emissions or lower our electricity bills because of the uh, ex extensive uh, growth of our bills across uh, the city and across the province because of this government's unwillingness to uh, take meaningful action. Um, whether it's community leagues, whether it's nonprofits uh, from various sectors, um, you know, looking to access federal funding for green initiatives. And again, if we have a, a provincial government that's saying, well, we don't agree with your, um, you know, uh, uh, decisions around emissions, or we don't agree with your decisions around how you're funding green initiatives in our community, so we are not going to match those funding agreements, that is going to have a negative impact on our community as well. And so it really goes back to the priorities of this government that they aren't willing to adequately consult. Uh, the fact is, it, it seems quite clear that the, the Premier, definitely the Deputy Premier, because they um, made the, the statement that they had not even read the legislation uh, to um, a, a journalist at the time. That was the Deputy Premier from uh, Lethbridge East, I believe, uh, Mr. Speaker. But many many of the uh, government members and the uh, cabinet members who at one point uh, completely disagreed with this legislation are now uh, willing to uh, put federal funding at risk for important projects in our community, um, are willing to put their relationships with municipalities and their relationships with nonprofits uh, in jeopardy uh, because they aren't willing to stand up to this uh, rather draconian piece of legislation, Mr. Speaker. And so, uh, again, I ask all members in the House this evening or this morning <laughs> uh, to please consider uh, supporting uh, this reasoned amendment uh, because the fact is it's very clear uh, over the weeks that we've uh, been discussing this legislation uh, that this government has not adequately consulted with nonprofit organizations, with municipalities, and that there is a grave concern about critical infrastructure and housing initiatives across this province. We've seen uh, previously, I think that uh, we had a little bit of clarity uh, this afternoon in question period from the Premier that uh, there isn't a plan to go back on the, the Spring Bank uh, dam project, but um, you know that apparently was only cleared up today and there's many other initiatives whether we're talking about the green line in calgary the funding around that uh, for a moment in edmonton uh, the valley line west lrt uh, that we had committed the provincial funding to match the federal funding uh, under our time in in government there was a, a moment where there was some concern around that uh, because decisions and comments that the minister uh, the ucp minister at the time was making and so, again, when we look at these important uh, infrastructure projects um, that could be put in jeopardy because of a disagreement between the federal and provincial government, that is very concerning to me and, and should be very concerning to all Albertans. And I think uh, from the pushback that we've seen, again, from, from all sides, not uh, simply from progressives, um, you know, we, we've seen many 
uh, conservatives very concerned with this as well about what it might do to our or what it will do to our economic environment the stability uh, ensuring that the rule of law is upheld in our province that is not going to have negative impact on our relationships uh, between stakeholders mr. speaker thank you are there others on amendment r a to the honorable member for Edmonton Riverview Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I'm happy to join the debate on RA2, um, which indicates that we should not now read a second time um, Bill 1, because the Assembly is of the view that the government has failed to adequately consult with nonprofit organizations and municipalities on the potential risks this bill presents to federal funding for their projects, including critical infrastructure and housing initiatives. And uh, to even go more broadly uh, than uh, this uh, amendment, I just wanted to go right back to the legislation as it relates to our A2 amendment and uh, describes a provincial entity in quite a bit of detail, you know, and, the, and this is uh, indicating, the reasoned amendment is indicating how um, Nonprofits, of course, are impacted. Uh, municipalities are impacted, but it's also even broader than what we're suggesting here. It's talking about uh, public agency, as defined in the Alberta Public Agencies Governance Act, a crown-controlled organization, as defined in the Financial Administration Act, an entity that carries out a power, duty, or function under enactment, an entity that receives a grant or other public funds from the government <coughs> that are contingent on the provision of a public service, a regional health authority. I'm not even half done. Like, this list is, ex is extensive. It is, like, uh, so broad-ranging. I am uh, very curious and perhaps concerned also whether the government can actually manage all of this to understand what a provincial entity is. They've created legislation that is so unwieldy that it's going to be impossible to implement or to even to understand. And then the other piece that is, again, uh, extremely wide-ranging is the federal initiative, means a federal law, program, policy, agreement, or action, or a proposed or anticipated federal law, program, policy, agreement, or action. These are the things that uh, this legislation is supposed to re regulate and uh, that are, you know, extremely, uh, uh, I don't know, really uh, a very broad-ranging, uh, significant number of organizations in this province would be impacted. And of course, as many of my colleagues have spoken about already, so many federal initiatives, uh, based on the definition I just read, uh, are, you know, uh, intersecting with all of these organizations that serve Albertans. So, if we even just look at one area, let's look at affordable housing, the annual report of seniors in housing 2021-22 uh, uh, talks about uh, federal money that they get. It talks about the Canada Infrastructure Program, the Canada Housing Benefit, for people who don't know, that's the Rent Supplement Program, um, Capital Grants from National Housing Strategy, and the Social Housing Agreement. And these programs, in one year alone, uh, invested from the federal government $91 million, approximately. So we're not talking about just a little bit of money. We're talking about a significant amount of money that is fundamental to Albertan, Alberta's uh, housing, uh, affordable housing in our province that serves vulnerable Albertans. And this legislation really shakes that all up and makes those bodies that receive that funding very concerned. We already have difficulties. Uh, Mr. Speaker, in terms of the provincial government willing to work with the federal government on these programs. You know, one of the things uh, that the UCP did when they first came into government is they cut the rent supplement program uh, by about $16 million. And of course, we have matching funds with the federal, so if we cut it here, then we're not going to get the federal money. And uh, I've heard time and time again from so many stakeholders that uh, they, the, 
the province is missing in action. They actually are going directly to the federal government, uh, working with their local municipalities. I hear this from so many housing management bodies, nonprofits, all across this province. They say the province is missing in action. They're not investing. They, what did they do since they've become government? They wrote a report. That's about all they've done. And they talked about privatizing affordable housing and selling off a whole bunch of our assets uh, and uh, doing a real estate review to see where they can, uh, you know, get rid of assets. And then they say, this is back to Bill 78. And then they say that that will go back into affordable housing. Yet the legislation, of course, never indicated that. And so that was an amendment that we brought forward for that to support affordable housing in our province. Regardless, uh, this government has really dropped the ball on housing. And I mean, I suppose it, it, it seems kind of ridiculous for me to say this, but it perhaps uh, indicates how little this government cares about affordable housing, is they've even just amalgamated a whole bunch of stuff into one ministry. So seniors and housing are all in uh, seniors and community social services. Housing doesn't even have a title anymore in a ministry. You know, it used to be with seniors and housing, which gave it some, our government gave it uh, some importance, of course, by having a ministry that uh, was specifically focused on those two aspects. But this government has just amalgamated a, a tremendous amount of uh, very important supports for vulnerable Albertans into one ministry. And it's, I'm sure it's overwhelming for the minister because it's untenable. How can he uh, be able to manage all of that? And really, I haven't heard hardly anything from him except for his own personal sharing of his experience working in the nonprofit sector uh, since he's come into office. No investments in affordable housing, uh, no movement on that area. So it's, you know, these investments we receive from the federal government are not trivial. And I think uh, the housing sector has every right to be, you know, extremely concerned about this legislation. And that's why this amendment uh, to Bill 1, RA2, is so important. And I urge all the people in this legislature to vote in favor of it. Because we really haven't given voice to those housing management bodies to uh, nonprofits in the sector. And, uh, you know, I've said this many times in the House, we know that we have, you know, less affordable housing uh, that it, than is needed in our, in our province. We have less than the national average, about 4.3% of, of housing is affordable. Here in Alberta, it's only 2.9%. We're behind. We need to invest significantly, but sadly, this government has not chosen to. And if they're not going to work with the federal government uh, and their uh, uh, robust programs, like the ones I've indicated to, to you here, the Canada Housing Benefit, capital grants from the National Housing Strategy, and the Social Housing Agreement, um, we're not going to have the housing we need. And indeed, that's our situation at the moment. And uh, municipalities are doing the best they can. I mean, we know we're in a cri when a crisis. It's, it's, I don't know, what did someone say to me? It's like with the wind chill and everything, it's, you know, more than minus 30 below you know, today or something, something like that this evening. And I know that people are living rough out in the community, in, uh, in the Edmonton area, and they need that housing. They need permanent supportive housing, because we know that vulnerable people with mental health and addiction issues, uh, providing them just with the bricks and mortar of a building is not enough. We must provide them wraparound services. And the city of Edmonton has been crying honestly, literally, for a long time, trying to uh, move this government to see the importance. And uh, their asks haven't even been that significant. You know, I think it was about $9 million they looked for for operating these wraparound services for permanent supportive housing. And uh, this government has kept turning, uh, turning away, turning a blind eye. And <clears throat> literally, people are dying in our city. 
And we know that people are losing limbs because of being frozen. Uh, horrific things are happening in our community. And this investment in affordable housing is so key to making sure that people are safe and that they live with, with dignity. So that's why uh, RA2, uh, voting in favor of that is so important because we need every dollar we can get and we need the province to step up. But for some reason, uh, they haven't uh, uh, decided that this is an important part, even though we have a significant surplus, it's not an important part of uh, what they see as uh, key for uh, helping uh, our, uh, our city, our province. We know that, um, you know, it costs more to, for someone to live rough, you know, costs us as uh, uh, the public more than to have, than to give them affordable housing. So anyway, there's just a million arguments. Uh, there's human rights, economic argument to having enough uh, housing for people. And of course, we want to work very closely with the federal government to ensure that happens. Uh, and if uh, this Sovereignty Act uh, isn't um, willing to work with uh, the federal government, which it certainly seems to indicate it will, we think, whoa, we need to slow down and we need to make sure that we understand the consequences of this very significant legislation right. and have, uh, has the UCP consulted with the housing management bodies. We have uh, Greater Edmonton Foundation here uh, that serves seniors. Uh, over f about 4,000 seniors live in uh, lodges across the Greater Edmonton area. In Calgary, we have Silvera, which does amazing work uh, serving seniors in uh, uh, keeping them well housed and supported. We also have uh, sort of our affordable housing partners like Civita and the Calgary Housing Company. And these are the big four, we call them, that uh, do significant work uh, to support uh, Albertans who are vulnerable. And uh, has the UCP spoken to them about any concerns that they might have regarding uh, how uh, this legislation will impact uh, the receipt of dollars? Also, I wasn't, not long ago I was at a, a grand opening of a facility in Calgary and it was a, a kind of a unique uh, uh, joint venture between uh, home space and in from the cold. And uh, Calgary, city of Calgary put in millions of dollars, uh, the feds put in millions of dollars and the province was put in very minimal. People are overcompensating for the province instead of the province stepping up. So a lot of... Uh, you know, some of the, what this bill could create even more difficulty in the sector seems to be already manifesting. And it's not only in this area, but other nonprofits that uh, certainly do uh, tremendous work, uh, certainly nonprofits that work with uh, vulnerable Albertans that use drugs, Jasper Place Wellness Center, certainly some of the inner city agencies like Boyle Community Services. Um, uh, Bissell Center, those places, um, those are also nonprofits that are so important to making sure vulnerable Albertans are supported. But we know that because of the UCP's very narrow view of what needs to happen for people who use substances, use, use drugs, of course we know that we, you know, evidence shows that we need a continuum of services. We certainly do need to have detox centers, we need to have residential treatment, we need all sorts of the things that UCP likes to call the recovery, but we need harm reduction services too. And that's one area the UCP wants to cut back in and has already. So much so that we already know that they have cut federal funding, or have not received federal funding to uh, to, uh, they have not received federal funding, uh, or they have received federal funding that they have rejected. That's already happened. We know that. The different harm reduction programs, or they've delayed harm reduction programs because uh, of their very narrow ideological view on what 
uh, people need who are using drugs. But we know, I mean, one of the things that we certainly say is that how can anybody go into recovery uh, if they're dead? We need to support people where they're at. So harm reduction services are fundamental. And right now, we really continue to be in a significant crisis. And so working with the federal government to make sure that there is a significant investment in that area is important. And with that, Mr. Speaker, I will adjourn debate. Thank you. Honourable members, having heard the motion as proposed by the Honourable Member for Edmonton Riverview to adjourn debate, all those in favour, please say aye. aye. Any opposed, please say no. In my opinion, the ayes have it. That motion is carried and so ordered. The Deputy Government Whip. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I move that we adjourn the Assembly until 1.30 uh, tomorrow afternoon, December 6th. Honourable Members, having heard the motion as proposed by the Deputy Government Whip to adjourn the Assembly until later today at 1.30, all those in favour, please say aye. aye. Any opposed, please say no. In my opinion, the ayes have it, and the House stands adjourned until today at 1.30 p.m.